Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining our uh, Quality of Life and Public Safety Committee tonight. Uh, today is Tuesday, April 19th, 2022. Um, so just want to um, share a little information here. This meeting is being broadcast and streamed from the Hartford Public Access TV, Comcast, and Frontier Government Channel 96 and 6032. Uh, it will also be streamed via hpatv.org, uh, the HPATV's Roku, TV Apple, TV and Amazon TV app. Uh, it will also be uh, rebroadcasted and made available on HPATV YouTube page. So today we have an extensive uh, uh, agenda with several items. And uh, before I begin, I'd like to introduce everyone. So we have Lieutenant Zarger. We have uh, our council member, Councilman Nick LeBron. We have uh, Councilwoman Shirley Surgeon. Uh, we also have uh, assistance to uh, uh, Majority Leader Councilman TJ Clark II. And we have our assistant Haley Green Ortiz and Noelia Ortiz. And we have Corp Council here, Nat uh, Attorney Natalie Fio Fiola Gugrieri and uh, also uh, Chief Barco from the Hartford Fire Department, Director Webster from ESNT. We have Lieutenant Anthony Pia. We have our uh, Chief of uh, Police, Chief Jason Thody. Uh, we also have uh, Director Kim Oliver. We have Sergeant Chris Mastroani, and we have Sergeant Anthony Rakowski. Did I pronounce that right? We also have uh, our Assistant uh, Chief of police as Kenny Howell. I'm not sure if I'm missing anyone. Um, I think I have that covered. And before we start, I would like to ask for uh, Lieutenant Zarger to please announce the uh, missing person. Thank you, Councilman. So uh, we're, I'm going to show the picture in a second. I just want to read her name first. Um, we're actively looking for uh, Jemira uh, Halstead. She's been missing since yesterday at about uh, 4, 4 p.m. She's 11 years old. She was last seen in the Nelton Court area. Um, we're trying to find any other better video. Um, we've made all the notifications we can and we're currently working with the FBI to see if there's any other additional federal resources they can bring in. Um, she's currently um, not to believe to have been abducted and this is our first time going missing. So um, I'll share a picture as best I can of her. So this is a most recent picture that we have of her. And she's about uh, five feet tall and weighs about hundred pounds. Thank you. Can you show that photo again, please? Uh, just hold it yes, up for a few seconds. So please, if anyone have any information, please call HPD right away. Um, missing person since yesterday, as uh, Lieutenant Zarger just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, thank you. So we're going to start the uh, meeting off now with uh, Director Susan Webster from ESNT with a presentation. You have the floor. Thank you, Councilman Sanchez, and good evening. Good evening, Council members and colleagues. Um, I have been asked this evening just to give a quick report on the current status of our CAD project, RMS project, and our, um, our radio project. Um, so right now, uh, the radio project is still in the RFP phase. Um, the RFP closed on April 8th. We did get some responses. This is the second time that we've put out this RFP. Um, the first time we had to throw out the RFP because we felt as though the responses did not meet the needs of the city of Hartford. Um, therefore, we put the RFP out again and we have received responses back. So the RFP committee consists of members of ESNT, HPD, Hartford Fire, as well as procurement, finance, um, and MHIS. So those members are meeting, reviewing the RFP responses. Um, we do have a timeline in place, and we are hoping to make an award sometime in June. Um, we are aware of the process. We've already done this once before with the first ones. Um, so we're confident that we are going to be able to select a vendor through this particular process. Um, any questions regarding the radio project or the radio RFP that we have out right now? I'm sorry, what was the question, please? Does that, I just didn't know if anybody had any questions regarding the radio RFP or the radio project. Okay. 
Um, if not, I will move on to the CAD RMS project. So um, on March 18th of last year, we cut over to our new CAD system. It is currently fully functional. We are working on um, just some other tweaks to the system with both HPD, our dispatchers, and Hartford Fire. Um, we are completing the data conversion of the records management system. We are scheduled to have that complete by the eight, um, 518 of 2022, meeting weekly with Central Square, the PD, and um, FIRE as well to hopefully move that process through quicker as, as we can. Um, but right now we are on target to cut that over on 518. And that's really all I have unless anybody has any questions for me regarding either of those two projects or anything else I can answer. Yes, I do have a couple of questions. Um, on my question with ESNT are, um, and it has to do with the uh, compatibility of the system with the radials, uh, communication through um, those radials. And also, I like to speak about the staffing at ESNT and how do they prioritize calls. Okay, um, so as far as the compatibility, we are striving to purchase a Project 25 compliant radio system, and that deals with interoperability. So right now, whatever radios that they're using in the field for Hartford Fire, which is the Motorola solution, as well as the Harris solution that HPD and DPW are both using, all of those radios will be compliant with whatever radio system we choose through the RFP process. Um, so there should be no issues moving forward once we upgrade to a digital system. The current system is analog, um, but once we move to a fully digital Project 25 compliant system, everything should be compatible. And those are um, standards of the public safety industry. Okay, so when, when we got this new system a couple of years back, I think it was pre-COVID, right? Um, I thought we were going to eliminate the analog system. Yep, and that's what the RFP process is doing, Councilman. So this RFP is going to replace the entire citywide radio infrastructure, and we will get removed the entire analog system. Everybody will be switched over to the digital system. Currently, the only ones on a digital system is Hartford Fire, and we are connected to the state of Connecticut, and we can use that, utilize that digitally. Um, Hartford Police and DPW are using analog um, the analog system, but their end user equipment is digital ready. So once we switch over to the system, all of theirs will work with the new system. So then uh, let me ask you this, uh, has, has the HPD or HFD been invited um, to participate in the usage of these radios for compatibility and also for service uh, and to find out um, if there's any kinks that needs to be taken out. Yes, as a matter of fact, we have members of Hartford Police and Hartford Fire sitting on the RFP committee. Okay, and you did give the date on when to expect the, uh, the bid to be finalized. So the RFP closed on um, April 8th. Well, we are currently putting everything together, making sure all of the vendors were compliant with the RFP and um, the committee will start to meet again. And we anticipate to have an award sometime in June of this year. Uh, how many bidders? Um, I believe there are three. Okay. And, you know, in the past, I've, I've requested emails for updates and I have not seen any yet. Um, please, please make sure that we receive an update on who received the, the award uh, for this bid. And I would like to be a part of this, this process and, as well as my colleagues um, so that we can see how this is uh, operating. As the RFP process? Uh, no, not the RFP process. After they come in, after you award the, uh, the bid. I'd it's like to see how the equipment is operating with the okay. fire police. Uh, any any question for my colleagues, Councilman LeBron? Yes, do you, um, uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, I'm sorry, woman. I'd like to recognize our Council President Mally Rosado. I'm sorry, I didn't see you on the screen earlier. Yes, uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Um, the and maybe this question is not for this meeting. I know it's a hefty agenda, but just curious if you could give us a, a brief update, uh, Director Webster, in terms of the EST's integration with the iHeart team and how that's coming along. 
Oh, absolutely, um, Councilman LeBron. Um, Councilman Sanchez, do you want me to answer that question now or, or finish the questions that you had proposed? I believe, I believe uh, yeah, you can answer that question and then we'll go back to the staffing, but I believe we have Jameson Ball here also uh, to speak on that. Okay, um, we are so excited about the HART team. Um, I have been involved in the process since the beginning um, with Chief Thody, Chief Freeman at the time, and um, now Chief Barco. Um, HPD was the first ones to kick it off where they were requesting them in the field and working through our dispatchers. Um, just last week, we implemented a new protocol where the dispatchers are interrogating callers. So if they are having mental health issues and we feel as though it might be a good response for the heart team, we will um, dispatch the heart team. We communicate with them via telephone and then they sign on through the PD radio system in order to communicate back with dispatch. Um, so we have been, I'm going to say, and I don't have the exact numbers, but about 20 calls per week between um, the teams, and that doesn't count Capital Region, who was previously responding to these calls. Um, so we're super excited. It's going very well. And we've actually had people from other municipalities reach out um, to see how things are going and see if this might be something that they can implement in their community as well. Thank you, Director Webster. And through you, uh, Mr. Chair, just following up, uh, uh, Director, in terms of anything, in terms of operationalization, you know, we've worn multiple meetings together. And so if there's anything I can do to be of assistance or my office as well, please feel free to reach out, particularly around the IHART team. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And Officer, Officer Lieutenant Sergeant Ball, what's your title? Jameson Ball. Oh, sorry, just getting off mute. How are you this evening? I'm doing I just, well. It's Officer Jamie Ball. Okay, and can you speak on that as well? Speak on what? On, on uh, Councilman LeBron's question. Or are you here for the Project Lifesaver? So I'm here for the Project Lifesaver piece. Sir. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, any question from any of my other colleagues? Council President Rosado. Chair, I just I just want to commend um, Susan Wester for the amazing job that she's doing. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Thank you, Director Webster. I uh, appreciate your presentation. I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about this uh, implementation and programs and uh, also the CAS system. Um, but I do need to hear about the staffing on ESNT and how do they prioritize the calls. Um, okay, so those are two different questions. So I'll start with the prioritization of calls. So as those calls come into the dispatch center, um, the dispatchers follow a certain protocol um, as they're asking questions of the caller. So first they identify whether it's a police, fire, or EMS related call. There are different protocols that we follow. Um, safety is our number one concern. And based on what the nature of the call is, those calls are prioritized into three levels, A calls, B calls, and C calls, A's being the highest priority, C's being the lowest priority. Fire has A and C calls, and law enforcement has all three of those, um, As an EMS has A and C calls as well. So based on what their particular call is for, if it's uh, any violence, if it's involving a weapon, um, those are all A calls, domestic calls, uh, and such. Um, I mean, I can go into that more in depth or, or I'm not sure exactly sure, um, you know, how much of an answer you want on that question, but those call takers are, they are um, trained in how to prioritize those calls and what, what questions to ask callers when they call into the communication center. So we know how quickly we need to have the responders get to the scene. Um, and that's all in the CAD system. It also tells us how many officers we need to send, how many pieces of fire apparatus need to go, um, if we need a paramedic level or, or a basic level ambulance. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes, uh, but for example, if there's a call for, um, let's say there's a, a domestic call, right? Uh, someone wielding a, a knife. Um, but an officer arrives and it's, it's more of a domestic of violence than uh, an actual injury or um, an actual attack. Um, what, what's the procedure on that? 
So once the officer gets to the scene, they're in control of the scene and they will dictate whether they need an additional, any additional officers, if they need an EMS response to the scene. What we do in the communication center is we try and gather as much information as we can from the caller, determine if there is a life safety issue, and then we prioritize the calls that way. So if it's a, if it's a call where someone has a knife and it's a domestic involved, we will prioritize that as an A call because there's life safety at risk. We'll get multiple officers to the scene as soon as possible. And once they get there, if they downgrade it or they, they cancel an ambulance because there's no need, um, but the officers, once they arrive on scene, they can ask for additional resources or um, release resources if necessary. So is, is so are the officers that respond to these type of calls, are, are they, they, have they received training to identify if it's a mental illness? The call that once the officers arrive on scene at the call, I yes, can use the yes, facility to answer that question. Chief. I'm sorry, what was that again? What was the question? So the officers trained to identify if it's a mental illness issue on a domestic call or any other call. Um, any call, uh, officers go through a, a CIT program in the academy, and then we have an advanced CIT program that uh, about 70 of our officers are certified in. Uh, that was the training basis that we were using to respond to the mental health calls um, prior to the, the heart team coming in. So now it'll be a collaborative effort. Um, but yes, officers are trained to identify people in mental health crisis. And the heart team has been uh, implemented and how successful is it so far? I know it's, uh, it's been a short time, but how successful is it right now? I mean, so far it's been great. I mean, this has been a long time coming. Our officers have embraced it. Um, this is a much better uh, solution uh, than, you know, having clinicians that are, that are better trained, that are, that are going to follow up and provide long-term care versus an officer, uh, you know, going uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, making the call more tense and, and only being able to provide, um, you know, band-aid solutions. We don't have the ability to do the, the long-term work that the hard team is going to be able to do. So, so far it's been great. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Chief. And, uh, and uh, Director Webster, how about the staffing there? How is that sure. this moment? So we are um, in a significant staffing crisis right now in the communication center. Um, and this isn't just a Hartford issue. This is a Connecticut issue. This is a, a countrywide issue where communication centers are very, very short staffed. We have been working with human resources, um, both the police and the fire department doing job fairs um, and getting people to come in and apply for this job. Um, I am very pleased to say that we just hired a full-time training coordinator. We just hired, which starts next week. We just hired two full-time supervisors that also start next week. We hired six full-time dispatchers that will be starting um, over the next several weeks. Um, we have nine additional candidates from a testing that we just did that we will be interviewing and putting through the backgrounds. Um, to start in those positions. And we also have approximately 18 more people sitting in queue ready to test. Um, Human Resources has been doing phenomenal working with us um, just to get the word out that, you know, we need people, we need dispatchers who are, who are ready and prepared to serve the city of Hartford. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased over the progress over the last two months because I know that our dispatchers are under a lot of stress. It's very difficult for them to work in a communication center such as Hartford, we're the largest in the state and arguably the largest in New England as a, a, a self-standing communication center. Um, and we are working very aggressively to get them the help that they need to take the stress off of them and get some new employees in here um, to help the center, make sure that our officers and our firefighters are safe in the fields and of course, support their residents here in Hartford. And the 18 candidates are in, who are in queue, how long have they been in queue? How long have they been waiting? I'm going to say approximately two weeks. Um, it could be a little bit longer. I just checked with Human Resources today. We are scheduling an additional test. As a matter of fact, we've been working with them. So we are gonna assist them in doing the testing so we can get more testing through quickly um, because we have had a lot of more interest in the position. Um, Hartford Police has been great. They've been inviting us to their job fairs. Um, and we did one with the, the, the fire department as well. And, and they've been going very, very well. Okay. And then um, 
these candidates, uh, knowing that the city has over 62 different languages, are, are most of them bilingual? Is that a qualification? It's not a qual. It's not a requirement, um, but it's certainly preferred. And if we had two candidates with the exact same amount and they they came out the same on the list, and one spoke Spanish and one did not, we'd obviously take the Spanish speaking individual. That goes with Hartford residents as well. Um, right now, unfortunately, we we aren't afforded that ability to do that because we we need people to come in and get trained as good dispatchers. That being said, we do utilize two different language lines, one that's done through the state of Connecticut through the 911 system, and one that we use through the city of Hartford. So um, if in fact we're unable to understand the language and we need a translator, we have a choice of these two different services that we can use. My apologies for the background. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I think that's all I have for you right now, uh, Director Walter. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for the hard work that you've been putting in to making uh, the ESC successful. Uh, um, thank you, sir. Give me one second, everyone. Council President, can you take over for a second, please? Next, next item will be uh, we're going to move to item two point five which is a resolution stating that the city of Hartford Public Safety Agency, the Hartford Police Department look into implementing Project Lifesaver. And I believe we have um, uh, Officer Bell to speak on that. Thank you. Um, so do we have Officer Ball, um, the floor is yours. If you can shed some light on this uh, resolution that Councilwoman put uh, put forward, or Councilwoman, did you want to speak for, first before you we turn it over to the officer? If you don't mind, the um, floor Madam is yours. Chair. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so basically, one of the things as a, uh, a Harford residents who have experienced uh, taking care of our elderly parents. I saw an article in the Hartford Current, reached out to Chief Toady uh, several uh, months ago. I know he's been quite busy. So um, knowing that um, as our population age in the city of Hartford, one of, the, one of our public safety uh, guidelines is to protect all the residents in Hartford. And again, our populations are aging in the city. And in the resolution, it talked about the percentage of um, um, Black and uh, Latinos in the city, you know, that by, you know, 20, uh, 2035, you know, we're going to have so much increase in Alzheimer's that one of the things I believe the city should be doing right now in the help with public safety is to protect all of our citizens, um, you know, and our seniors are the most vulnerable um, citizens in the city. And when I saw the article and reached out to um, uh, Chief Toady, he was extremely, uh, you know, valuable. He did return the phone call right away, thought it was a great idea. Uh, and so this basically, this resolution is a follow-up to uh, see if we can get something started. Um, my, um, our wonderful assistant, Sadea uh, Lee, did some background information, talked to several organizations that does uh, project lifesavers that helps seniors to be located within 30 minutes. And so she has asked, um, I'm not sure if it's, um, not sure, um, did we ask uh, someone from another town who has implemented um, this program to see if they could um, shed some light and how it is working. And if it's something the city of Hartford would like to start doing, knowing that uh, our population is aging in the city. So through you, Councilman, um, Madam Chair, or, okay, are we back to- um, We are, we are, we are. All right, right. okay. Through you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, you know, this is a really important um, project that I really believe the city should really um, undertake. Uh, about a week ago, I believe if I saw in the Hartford, um, Hartford neighbors over subscribes to it and on the television, a family uh, dad was missing. 
Uh, and it was very heartfelt where, you know, you're looking for family members, you can't find them. And I believe this program will be a really and a great program for our seniors and our, not even seniors so much, but the family members who are taking care of their parents in the city right now. It, um, to find a loved one, uh, you know, within 30 minutes is unbelievable. Um, you know, before I just share a short story with you, uh, Mr. Chair, you know, before my parents passed on, I was up at one o'clock one morning in my night clothes, you know, looking for, you know, my mom, you know, on the street. So I can truly relate to a lot of the families who's going through this. And I really do hope, um, Mr. Chair, that, you know, all the council members have signed on and in support of it. And hopefully the, um, through uh, Chief Toady, we can get this program up and going. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, so, Officer Ball, I'm not sure if you spoke on this yet. No, he did not. Oh, I have not. Okay, so um, you have the floor, Officer Ball. All right, great. Well, uh, thank you. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Jamie Ball. I'm a police officer with the Simsbury Police Department. Um, just a quick background. I've been with the Simsbury um, Police Department for about 11 years. Prior to that, I worked in Granby as an officer. Um, so collectively, I have about 20 years of law enforcement experience. Um, I've been an emergency medical technician uh, for the last 25 years. So I'm really uh, vested in, you know, helping out, you know, the population. Um, one of the things that uh, here at the Missouri Police Department specifically, um, I'm the community services officer. So what that means is I'm a dedicated officer um, to work as a liaison with our community members, um, organizations within the town. Um, I work as a liaison very closely with our social services department. So we'll talk daily as we look at anybody who's 60 years of age and older, where we've responded to medical calls, lift assists, um, people with, um, you know, mental crisis, things like that. You know, I'm kind of the, uh, the person that can, can take it one extra uh, step where our patrol officers may not have that kind of time because um, they have to go call the call so that they can refer it to me and I can reach out. And like just today, I went out to a house with somebody, a uh, social worker from our social services department to work with someone. Um, so that's kind of what I do here at the police department. One of the um, tools that we have is called Project Lifesaver. Our department um, is one of the few departments um, in the state that has this program. It's uh, been very beneficial for us. We've had it close to 10 years now. Um, our department is 40 officers strong and all 40 officers are certified um, in Project Lifesaver. So what that means is that they've gone through a training program, which is about two hours uh, for each officer. They've done a practical skill to be able to demonstrate that they can know how to use the equipment and, and use it. So basically what Project Lifesaver is, is that um, there was, there's three demographic of population uh, out there. Um, it's not just the elderly with Alzheimer's, um, you know, we also look at um, children with autism, um, as well as anybody who's diagnosed with Down syndrome. Um, those three populations have a tendency to, um, without any warning, wander away from their home for whatever reason that is, um, you know, and it, it could be uh, distractions, it could be noise, it could be curiosity, whatever it is, it's causing them to walk out the front door and maybe their caretaker, parent, whoever, you know, doesn't see that right away. Cause obviously we're doing things, you know, we're either, you know, cooking or, um, you know, watching TV, whatever, we can't be, you know, on top of somebody 24 seven. So all it takes is 30 seconds for that door to open and somebody to wander out. And, you know, typically, you know, the average person can walk about, you know, four miles within an hour. So what um, research was finding back when this program was developed, um, you know, back in the uh, early 90s was that uh, somebody could walk away and all these resources, fire department, ambulance, all these police officers were getting these 911 calls to respond out and it was taking hours to find someone. Well, as I just told you, if somebody can walk four miles within an hour, um, you know, your elderly, you know, mother or um, your autistic son could be, you know, very far away in a short period of time. And we don't have a lot of time to be able to locate somebody. So what Project Lifesaver is, is it consists of a transmitter um, that's put inside a bracelet, it's waterproof, and you know you put it on your around your wrist, you can put it on your ankle, um, and basically it transmits a signal with the battery in there as well, and then we have a receiver unit 
um, that works on radio waves. So just to clarify, this is not GPS. Um, it is just works on radio waves. So we have a receiver that when somebody walks away, they can call the um, parent or whoever, um, caretaker can call 911. We're gonna respond with the receiver because we know that they're a registered um, Project Lifesaver client. Um, and then from there, you know, we're going to uh, you know, hopefully deploy this device and we can locate the person. Results in nationwide studies have shown that we can find somebody usually um, if we get that phone call right away um, within 30 minutes. Um, the transmitter does um, have some limitations over a mile um, radius, um, it's not gonna be very effective. But one of the good things about it is, is like I said, if somebody's walking or wandering, um, with a GPS, you may be, you know, if somebody's in a basement, somebody's um, in a cement building, they're in a thickly wooded area or a swampy area, the GPS, it works just like your cell phone does. And you know that there's areas where your cell phone doesn't work. Um, you just don't get service for whatever reason. Whereas this is working on radio waves, um, tried and true technology that can go through some of these thicker brush areas, um, water areas, you know, and then go through cement buildings, things like that. Is it foolproof? No, but it's definitely beneficial. Um, you know, uh, there is some startup costs and things to it, um, but if I'm gonna try, I'm not a Zoom expert here, but the best way to explain this, if I can share my screen and I have a quick, um, I think it's just under a two minute video, if that's okay to sure. show everyone. Sure. I think it'll really hone this in a lot better. Well, it says it's, uh, I guess I have to be enabled to do that. Let me see how I do this here. Let me see here. Just give me one second here. I'm just trying to. Councilman Sanchez, um, yes. uh, if uh, uh, Officer Ball, if you wave over his picture, it'll give you the option to make a host in the right hand corner if you do it over his picture. Uh, already a co host. No, oh, there is a co host. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I have to find his name. Here we go. No, it's just, how about now? Yep, looks like it's uh looks like that worked. Okay. Let's see. Is everybody seeing like um a news article on the yes. display? Okay. So yeah, it looks like just under three minutes, and this is uh this happened here in Simsbury. Imagine the panic that would set in if your child suddenly turned up missing just by wandering off. So tonight we're learning about a once missing five year old who was brought back home safely thanks to a new piece of police equipment. Fox 51, John Charlton shows us how it works. There's another one over there. Looking after four small children, it's already a handful. Tomorrow's always going to be easier. <laughs> Having one of them with autism, <laughs> Rebecca Buckley really has to pay attention. Boxes is strapped around his ankle. So it won't come off unless we, we cut it off. 
It's better than GPS. We would make a turn. Because radio waves go through walls. Now we start to hear it. And sound off louder the closer. The signal is strong. The missing person is. I found you. <laughs> Fox is Simsbury's first found. And with this, many more can be. Me up here myself. Uh, if they look on their faces, what the, you can hear their child back to them. They're okay. It's, uh, it's great. Simsbury police want to encourage more people to take advantage of Project Lifesaver. It's a one-time fee of $300 to get set up in the program. If someone can't afford it, the PD says it has options to cover the cost. So great proof in the pudding. Help us. Help. <laughs> okay. That's very interesting. I, I love it. Yeah, so that kind of just uh, summarizes that a lot better than I can try and explain it. I think visuals are better. And, um, you know, it's like it's another tool in our toolbox to be able to offer our community. Um, when we tell people, hey, listen, we have this program, they're like, wow, that, that's fantastic. They're pretty excited about it. Um, you know, we uh, in our population, I'll be honest with you, we, we fluctuate. We don't have a ton of people. We have uh, one person currently um, in it. And there is a little bit of maintenance with it. So every like three to four months, I get a reminder um, sent to my email, and then I go out to that client's home. I do a visitation. Um, I check their battery and replace their battery. Um, I inspect the unit to make sure their transmitter is clean, that it's still working properly, um, change the bracelet, and then, you know, then they're good for another three or four months. Also, it's a good time to connect with the family to find out, hey, listen, has, you know, the condition of the person changed? Have they tended to want to wander more or less? Um, you know, sleeping habits, it's kind of a good way to just still stay connected with that person and update our files. So that way, if at two o'clock in the morning, a police officer gets a call or it's, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, any officer can pull up their name, see the latest information um, and use that when they respond out to the home. So we're, you know, so we're constantly, constantly on top of things. So it has been very beneficial since that um, news article. We have had a couple other um, successful stories as well, where um, you know, somebody's wandered off and it's been a quick, a quick find. So like I said, I think the one big thing that I want to portray to people is that it's not a GPS unit. So everybody's situation is a little different. Um, if it's something where, you know, the person, you know, hitches a ride or whatever, and they're on the other side of town or other side of the city, clearly this isn't going to work. But for the, the person like in this situation, um, this child that ran out the back, you know, the home, which is curious about the woods for whatever reason. And it's a really rocky mountainous terrain there. And again, our officers, you know, came to the police department. Um, let me show you real quick. You know, we have, a, we have in a uh, black backpack where all the officers know where it is. They can grab that and respond directly to the scene with that transmitter um, and receiver. And they can immediately start that search. So, so Officer Ball, what are, what are the um, annual fees? So there are any annual per se fees. It's more or less a, um, you know, the first time set up for the equipment of getting the, the fancy receiver and things. Um, there's package deals that the company Project Lifesaver offers. So that's right around, um, you know, just shy of $2,000 to get that initial receiver equipment. And like I said, they have some package deals where you can get a few transmitters, some bracelets, things like that to get your project up and going. Um, Ongoing to that, um, the transmitter itself, I know this is not very good on Zoom, but there's a, the little transmitter with the bracelet, that's about $275 or so, um, you know, to purchase that. So if somebody wants to enroll in the program, you know, we tell them, hey, listen, you're going to be right around the $300 mark between battery, bracelet, um, the case that the transmitter goes in, which is waterproof, you know, and then we put the bracelet on. Um, they're going to be just about that $300 mark. Now, the way we've worked it is that when we first got this program up and going, we reached out and we actually had a few, um, like local, uh, organizations, a couple church groups who were like, yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea. And they were able to give us some money towards this initial upstart. So basically the first few clients that we've had, haven't had to pay anything out of pocket for it. The only type of annual ongoing costs would be if we have to um, purchase, because every time we go out and we change a battery, we have to cut this bracelet off. 
Um, so we cut it off and it's almost like a hospital bracelet. So we cut it off and then we replaced that, replacing the batteries, which, you know, you can buy a package of those bracelets for, I think it's like 20 bucks or something. Um, the other cool thing is when it comes to kids, you know, nobody likes to, oh, I have this big, goofy, gaudy, um, you know, looking transmitter. Unfortunately, this is the size of it, but it does come in some bright colors like blue, green, red. So I tell the parents or caregivers, hey, listen, if they want something kind of cool to offset that, they can purchase um, some different colors and options as well. And, and those aren't that much. I think it's $10, $15 for a new case. Um, okay, and then, and, and then uh, so the lifespan of the transmitter depends on the battery. Correct. So some batteries, you know, the person can get through 60 days or about a month with it. Um, the batteries that we have, um, they're just lithium batteries um, that come in. We get, we buy them in packages like this. Um, you know, I've been getting about three months to four months out of those. Um, one of the things that we do pass out when somebody signs up for the program is we give them this, it's hard to see in plastic, but um, this is a uh, tester. So this black box will give this to the caregiver and then that way they can hold it over the front of the transmitter um, and they can test it. It'll blink and basically give them a positive reading if the battery is still good. Um, but either way, um, if the battery dies, we just say, hey, call us. We'll come out and change it sooner than not. Um, but generally three to four months, I'll go out there and I just change the battery and do an inspection of the device either way. So there is some management to it. But... Okay. Um, so is there any questions from my colleagues, uh, Councilman LeBron? So thank you for the presentation and uh, and your commitment to uh, this work. And thank you. Uh, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Councilwoman Surgeon, of, uh, for putting this through. Um, I see this, at, and, and maybe it's more of a comment than a question, but maybe it's a question for Chief Thody. Um, you know, I see this working well with the HART team, uh, Chief. And since uh, Director Webster, I don't see her on here. Could you imagine technology like this? Um, being integrated to our heart response in any way, because I, I, like with the credible respond, the credible like responders going out, and uh, you know some of those other folks, you know that may have mental health or, you know, um, the folks that get that leave frequently and things of that nature. Um, do you see this uh, as a as a device or a technology that would be instrumental to the operationalization of the heart team? Yeah, it certainly could be. I mean, I, you know, there's a couple probably places where this could could live. Um, you know, HHS has uh, you know senior services division. Uh, you know, could potentially live there. Um, you know, I think we'd have to look where you know where it's most beneficial you know the issues with with the heart team and uh, until it becomes uh, you know a 24 7 operation would be you know like the officer mentioned um you know if you get somebody that walks away at two o'clock in the morning um you know unfortunately police department fire department um you know and, and fire department is another option you know i don't want to throw chief barco under the bus but i mean they do some search and rescue stuff um you know if we're not ha if we're not looking for an actual police officer to be the one um, you know, doing this, then, then maybe some kind of, a, I mean, this certainly could qualify as an EMS type of call where, where maybe the fire department, um, you know, has, has a stake in it. I think, I think all that's worth talking about. Thank you, chief. And, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, any other question on um, council president Rosado? So, uh, my question is, uh, towards, um, officer Ball. Um, how many instances, or could you give me, give us any examples where you have found someone that has left their home and have had to call a crisis response team um, or a family member to come to the scene? Because um, they don't want to talk to the officer. They don't want to get in the car. So I'll be honest with you, this isn't something that we really run into as far as somebody who's in a mental crisis, um, you know, in a... I'm not a clinician, so the definition of that can be, you know, very um, a variety. But I just want to kind of, I guess, to clarify, this is very much for the person who is that Alzheimer's patient, who is the person with autism, who is just choosing to, for whatever distraction or reason, wanders off. It could be somebody who 
um, goes out like, you know, I've had an elderly grandmother who would go out and walk up and down the road just to get exercise. Well, you know, a lot of the people do that too, but then if they tend to wander, there could be a distraction and they just kind of wander off and they don't report back home or somebody who like this little kid who just jetted out the back door. Um, that's more of the situation. So it hasn't really been anything where, um, you know, part of one of our policies is, is that, you know, we're going to dispatch, you know, the fire department, the ambulance to assist us with helping to locate, you know, to have all resources on hand. We use the project lifesaver, we locate the client. We've never had a situation that I can readily think of on the top of my head where it's turned into a crisis where the person is um, despondent, refusing to cooperate with any emergency service personnel, anything like that. As a routine, once we locate the person, we do have the ambulance evaluate them. And then obviously we reunite them with their caregiver who knows them best and will be able to give us, you know, the parent or the caregiver, you know, uh, could say, hey, uh, you know, um, this person is not acting right because we've only met them for 30 seconds versus the caregivers with them, obviously living with them, most likely 24 seven. And we'll know, is that person operating on a normal or is this person off skew other than just walking away today? and can help make the decision, do they need more definitive care of being transported to the emergency department for a further evaluation? So I guess the long and short of it is not really, we do dispatch an ambulance on every recovery to have them do an evaluation and make that decision then. Thank you, I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Okay, Councilwoman Surgeon. Just one last comment um, through you, Mr. Chair. And, and basically, um, you know, we, as um, younger, we're becoming caregivers to our parents. And when we talk about public safety in our city, this is part of public safety. You know, well, this is one, another way of our community, uh, you know, looking at public safety, not just as, you know, uh, you know, locking up someone or, you know, uh, providing that side of it. These are some good public safety tools that we as a city of Hartford can extend to our residents. And I know the cost, you know, the council president asks, you know, how will we pay for this? Well, you know, one of the things is, you know, we have our residents and we as our residents age, we have to look into our budget and see if there's something we can do, but we also can apply for grants. There is all, there's so many different organizations out there uh, that work with uh, the senior population. Uh, you know, and as um, uh, Chief Toady talked about, you know, HHS, which I never really thought about, you know, going to that department. We have senior centers in our, you know, in our city. You know, this is a great program for programs like that, because our, unfortunately, our residents have walked off from some of those programs, you know, and everybody's frankly calling the the fire department, the police department, calling the hospital. So I think this is a great opportunity for us, you know, to provide this sort of support to our residents, um, to the city. I completely agree with you, Councilwoman Surgeon. Um, so with no other questions from my colleagues, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you uh, for your presentation, Officer Ball, and uh, explanation in the video. I think it's an excellent idea. And um, I would like to entertain a motion from my colleagues on this resolution. So move, Mr. Chair, to move uh, this uh, resolution back to council with a favorable recommendation. I second. Okay. All opposed? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain? Okay, pass. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, Officer Ball. Thank you, Officer Ball. Thank you for having me. Like I said, it's, it's just another way to, to network out and show that, you know, the police are here really is, you know, to help people, so. I appreciate you taking out your time to come to this meeting. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Okay, you too. Take care. Okay, so we're moving on now to Harford Fire Department. Chief Barco. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, always a pleasure to be here to see my fellow council people. Um, haven't seen you all in a while. Um, in our division heads, Mr. Oliver, Chief Doty, 
How's it going out there in FBI school? You look exhausted. They must be working you to death, but that's a good thing. Long days, long days. Yep. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen so you can see a presentation. Host disabled. Yeah, let me, uh, let me pin you down. Okay. You should be all set there. All right. Yes. That's the host disabled participating screen share. Nope. Not all set. Not all set. Okay, let me try this again then. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. I have you pinned. Okay, um, this one. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. Uh, so uh, the general updates for uh, March. So no PPE uh, procurement, procurement needs at this time. Uh, we have zero uh, members out on COVID-19. And as far as the pandemic, we continue to monitor the um, pandemic supply needs for the city and throughout uh, city employees. As you may be aware, we um, stock uh, some home test kits and uh, COVID-19 supplies, as well as uh, N95s and KN95 masks. Uh, we have a large supply um, in our warehouse. So whenever the need arises um, through a collaboration of the city and Health and Human Services, we usually um, deliver those supplies when needed. And also as well as uh, we deliver them upon request to uh, division city employees through their uh, division heads. Uh, so we recently had uh, promotions. We graduated 20 new firefighters from our academy. Uh, we promoted 32 people as of April 1st, which included two district chiefs, two fire captains, one special services captain and five FMO lieutenant and 16 drivers. What was unique about the driver's positions is uh, this was the first test where we encompass all three apparatus, which is a ladder driver, a pump operator and a district chief's aid driver into one test. So now <clears throat> everyone that passed that current test are able to drive all three vehicles and they're not specifically um, locked into driving one type of fire department apparatus. So uh, we did an event on April 4th in conjunction with Local 760 and the uh, UAPFF um, International Firefighters. It's called Fire Ops, where we had <clears throat> people from different municipalities. Uh, we had our risk assessment manager for the city and what we do is we bring every down, everyone down to our training academy at One Fisher Road. Uh, we get their vitals, we suit them up in fire department um, PPE, bunker coat, bunker pants, boots, gloves, everything we wear to go into a structure. And we take them into our burn building so they can kind of see, uh, they get a fraction of what it is we do on a daily basis in terms of structural firefighting. Uh, we show them how to force doors, we show them how some of our fire equipment works. We also gave them the opportunity to maneuver um, a hose line in zero visibility conditions so that they can understand what it is that we do. Um, everyone seemed to enjoy it. I think we had one person from News Channel 8 and she was really ecstatic and excited after the whole process uh, was completed. I think Councilman Mictum came down for a hot minute, but <laughs> he declined to go in at the time, but we said, we'll get him next year and any other council person that that, that wants to join. Um, so that, that went off pretty well without a hitch. So we had an arsonist uh, that was 
kind of setting fires in, uh, I believe it was uh, Parkville, Frog Hollow area in conjunction with our FMO and then the arson squad at the HPD, they did a really good job in, in securing a, an arrest for the individual. So kudos to them. Um, they always work well with our marshals and vice versa. Um, hired a new assistant chief of operations, February 22nd, Harry Tulier. He's a 25 year veteran of HFD. Um, he's doing an outstanding job up to this point. Um, he actually, Relieved me of a lot of duties, which was um, um, a long time coming. So, but I got to get more into delegation, like Chief Cody does. Um, and I'm taking lessons from him, but it's hard to do. Uh, recent community partnerships: we partnered with the City of Hartford Health and Human Services and delivered some home test kits to the neighborhood libraries for pickup. I'm sure you all seen the notification. And these are just a list of um, uh, test kits that we handed out um, since December. And as I said before, we're just going to continue to monitor the needs of the city and um, city employees and we'll uh, hand those out on an as needed basis. So our fire stat data for the month of, of February. I'm sorry, this is the, the month of March. Um, as you can see in the month of February, we were at a 50%. In March, we went up to 83% um, cost of service. So we met that target goal in under six minutes and 20 seconds. Our EMS calls for service in the month of March, uh, we actually uh, went up out of 1,528 calls, you can see we went up from 67% to 68%. So a lot of that is uh, since we moved to closest dispatch and then we're taking into consideration the call processing time. Whereas at this time last year, we weren't able to track the call processing time. So we've been working with uh, Ms. Webster and ESNT and and getting those times down so that we'll alleviate you know, we, we were able to reach our goals in under the five minutes. So our emergency response data, you can see for the month, the month of March, we had 1,531 calls for service with uh, Frog Hollow, Asylum Hill, and Northeast uh, being the most NRZs with calls for service. Uh, that being EMS, call, EMS calls, uh, motor vehicle accidents with injuries. Uh, rescue calls in the month of, month of March, we had 24 calls for service, Asylum Hill, Northeast Downtown, and uh, the West End had the most calls for service. And as usual, those are usually removable from stalled elevators. So these are all the fires for the month, month of March. We had a total of 58 calls for service and behind the rocks, Parkville and Northeast, along with downtown, had the most calls for service. Um, 17 building fires, uh, 10 vehicle passenger fires, and eight outside rubber fires were the big calls for service um, for the month of March. <clears throat> it, it always does that when I'm on camera. Uh, so location of structure fires in relation to firehouses, uh, you can see in the right column, the incident number and the response time. So if you look in the map area, you can see uh, engine seven had uh, two fire calls for service. Engine 10 had none. Engine one had uh, two in their area. Uh, engine 15 had two in their area and then 14 had three. So those are the fires in relation to the fire stations. The next slide is our demographics. Um, we're at a total of 334 people, which puts us up with the 20 graduating um, 354. So we're getting closer to our maximum number. Uh, the demographics, uh, you can see we're pretty much even across the board in terms of ethnicity, 31%. Ethnicity, uh, black, 34%, white, and 
Latino. Uh, any questions? Yes, I, I have a couple. If you can, well, you could keep the screen up. So um, what's the maximum number uh, for the fire department is required? Uh, 364. 364. Yes, sir. All right. I just want to go back to uh, you mentioned there was an arsonist in the Parkville area. Um, how many did was it determined how many fires they caused? Um, so I know at uh, one point it was some, I believe it was some, I, I, I'm not 100% sure how many fires they charged them with. But in that particular area, we had between three and four fires. I know one particular evening we had three fires uh, back to back in the same area. So I'm not I'm not 100 sure what how many he was actually charged for. Okay, if you can get back to us with that. Um, my other question is that recently it's been an uptick on fires. Uh, do we know what's the cause, or is it because you know? It doesn't seem that winter is leaving us yet anytime soon, um, but our people, I know there was a fire that was caused by a candle. Uh, what, what are the other reasons? Why was such an uptick uh, lately? So it, th there's not one particular reason why we are seeing so many fires in general, but um, in relation to just the common types of fires from smoking, um, in bed, like you said, candles or maybe an, an electrical outlet that malfunction, but there's not one specific reason that we've been seeing so many fires. And how many uh, inspectors do we have now um, in the fire department? Uh, so right now we have uh, 11 inspectors. And how many should we have? So we should have uh, 12, but okay. um, we only had, so when the state puts on a class for uh, fire inspectors, it's pretty much one class a year and that class is filled by inspectors throughout the state. So we, we've tried to initially get uh, them to host a class for Hartford, but it, that's kind of hard to do. And we're still looking into whether or not we can convince them to do that for us. I know the code is going to change, so this is going to be the last class until the end of next year. But um, they was gracious enough to give us five slots. Okay, and so the there was four firefighters that were promoted to inspectors, correct? Um, there was five. Five total, of five. Okay, and. What does it? What what do we need to do to to convince them to uh, accommodate HPD, I mean HFD, for those classes? What's the reason behind why they don't want to accommodate us? So the so all the certification is um, controlled by the state, and from my understanding, that there's only a few people that's able to teach these certifications. And it would be tremendously expensive because it's almost like sending one person to college. But because it's supplemented throughout the state, we there's no cost to us. Okay. You just have to impose it by a department. Okay. If you don't mind, can you take down the screen, please? Oh, sure. Just want to be able to see my colleagues uh, so that I can identify them for any questions. Oh, oh there we go. Okay. All right. Thank you for your presentation, Chief Parker. Appreciate it. Um, any question from my colleagues? Councilwoman Surgeon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to take a moment of um, your time, Mr. Chair, to thank um, the fire chief and his department. We had a, not sure what alarm fire we had on, on my street last night. Uh, 11 people have been 
unfortunately, you know, displaced. Uh, but I want to comment. I want to um, also also I want to commend the fire department um, because they were able to contain the fire to just that one home. Uh, as windy as we had last night's weather, um, the fire department did a fa fabulous job. The residents were extremely happy, especially the property owners next door. So I just want to thank uh, Chief Barco and I want to thank all the members of the fire department uh, that were uh, able to uh, you know, save a couple of the houses on my street last night. So Chief, thank you and thank your um, your detail and all the, um, I believe 11 company responded to this fire last night. And so thank you so very much um, for all your efforts and the efforts of your um, members uh, on behalf of the residents of the city. And also on behalf of the residents of my street who was extremely happy and pleased with the service they received last night. So Mr. Shear, thank you for allowing me to uh, thank um, the fire department for their efforts last night. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or statements? Okay, so we're gonna move on to item 2.7 presentation uh, for the Hartford Police Department, Chief Thody. Good evening again. Uh, this Good evening. is a, um, so Chief, um, Chief Howell has our PowerPoint back there uh, that he is gonna go through. Uh, before that, I'm gonna have, um, we have our, uh, Sergeant Rykowski uh, is our uh, supervisor in the arson section, and he can give you just a quick update on that um, serial arsonist that you mentioned earlier, since we do the, uh, we do the criminal investigation side of that. So Sergeant Rykowski, take it away. Good afternoon, Chief. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, in response to the uh, the arson arrest uh, mentioned, it was uh, Rafael Concepcion who was arrested. We had um, gotten some pretty good video, and he was located uh, by our patrol officers um, after uh, the day after the large fire on Heat Street, and he wound up admitting to his involvement um, in six total. Uh, we currently have him uh, charged for four of them. Um, he's on a $500,000 bond and there's two additional warrants pending uh, for him right now at court. So that's just a little more on that. So, Great um, job. Thank you. But, Sergeant Wachowski, this individual, is there some type of mental illness with him that he's started these fires or? Uh, it, according to him, he was, he was high um, on some form of narcotics. We don't know what. Um, it's our belief that it was uh, PCP possibly. Um, he freely admitted that, yes, this is me in the video. I did do this. And his response to us was I was simply high. So I, I don't necessarily think it's mental uh, illness so much as drug abuse. Okay. Thank you. For that. Right. Thank questions? you, Sergeant. Any questions from my colleagues for uh, Sergeant Rakowski? Oh, okay. You have the floor, Chief Thody. All right. ACL. Take it away. Thank you, thank you. Good evening to everyone. If I can just share my screen. Okay, let me pin you here. Okay, you have the floor, Chief. Just... 
If you have, we can see your screen. You just need to bring up the presentation if you can pull up the PowerPoint. Uh, can you see the screen? The PowerPoint? Yeah. You can see the screen, but you, have, you just have to bring up the PowerPoint. There you go. All right. And then just. OK, so we'll go with this um, again. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> OK, so I am going to talk about the uh, crime update, CompStat uh, numbers, uh, recent homicide arrests we made and firearms arrests and city events. So if you look at the ComStat, this is for the week of April 3rd through April 9th. Um, <clears throat> I'm over to the left side of the green, the, the green area. As you can see, there's one homicide uh, compared to last year around this time. Uh, there was none. That homicide is uh, 127 Bedford Street. Uh, officers responded on that Monday at 4 o'clock. Uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, AC Howell. Can you enlarge that screen? Can you make it bigger so that everyone can see it? Does that work? Thank you. Sorry. Perfect. Thanks. So on Monday, the fourth, at approximately uh, seven o'clock, officers responded to Bedford uh, Bedford Street and uh, located four individuals who were shot. Uh, one sir came to his injuries. Um, that is a current investigation um, that we are uh, conducting and we are making progress on. Uh, rapes this week uh, during that period is zero as it was last uh, year around this time. Uh, robberies, uh, we have two. Um, aggra aggravated assaults, um, as you can see, that's down substantially, almost 80% almost. Uh, we had five during that period. Uh, last year, this, this period, we had uh, 24. Um, burglaries, we have seven uh, during this period. Uh, last year, four. And um, auto theft, we have 50. Um, and as you can see, that's down. Uh, last year, this time is uh, we had 63, and I would like to attribute that to uh, the Greater Hartford Regional uh, Auto Task Force. Uh, I think they're doing a great job. That was uh, Chief Thody's idea. They're out there. Um, I think they're making a substantial difference in uh, the auto thefts. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, shooting incidents, we have two, um, as we did uh, last year around this period, uh, and the shooting victims are up um, by two. Uh, so we have four uh, last year around two. And of course, these are the numbers here in this uh, uh, light orange or yellow area uh, year to date. And uh, as you can see here, the homicides are up uh, by 66%. Uh, rapes are 0%, 5 and 5. Uh, looks like uh, the robberies are slightly up and um, the aggravated assaults are, are down substantially um, from last year, which was 186. Now we're at 88. Uh, slightly up is the burglaries um, and larcenies are down slightly, as well as, again, uh, I think the task force is doing an awesome job. Um, year to date, we're at 120, and uh, last year we're at 158. Uh, shooting incidents are down. Um, 
by 27%, and shooting victims are uh, down by 22%. Uh, so I want to uh, announce that today <clears throat> we made an arrest on a, a homicide uh, that was uh, on May 4th, 2021. So this is the second arrest. So on that date, May 4th, 2021, uh, we responded to 19 Norwich Street on a report of gunfire, and we found uh, three victims. Two had non-life-threatening injuries, one had succumbed to his injuries. Uh, we previously made an arrest, and as of today, we made a second arrest. So uh, kudos to our major crimes division, um, Lamont Fields, and there's his date of birth of 92897 of Hartford. Uh, was arrested uh, for conspiracy to commit murder, uh, murder and criminal possession of a firearm. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Uh, so the gun seizures, uh, we have uh, 111 guns taken off the streets of Hartford, uh, 86 or pistols, one rifle, three shotguns for four assault weapons and 21 ghost guns. Um, <clears throat> as you can see on 2021, the numbers were 341 total and uh, in 2020, 252 total. Um, so I think we do a very good job with uh, taking guns off the street. And this is a picture of the guns taken off the street in February. Um, so. AC, how was this uh, due to the, um, the creation of the street crime unit? Uh, yeah, so the, we, we have uh, the street crime unit out there, but uh, they work in conjunction with the uh, um, vice intelligence and so forth. So it's a collaborative effort. Um, they all work together, uh, they all share information, and this is the results. Um, so our, our department is doing um, an awesome job with um, you know, um, getting these guns off the street and we will continue to do such. And on the flip side of it, it's the drugs, right? So we have fentanyl, um, I mean, look, you know, 15,000 bags. That's, that's a tremendous amount of fentanyl that we took off the street. Um, uh, that equates to 4,000 some odd um, grams of fentanyl. Uh, we took off 674 uh, grams of crack um, and cocaine, 15,000 grams of cocaine. Uh, money seized, uh, around 200,000 and search warrants of 20. Okay, so the <clears throat> stole, stolen automobiles, again, um, I credit this to the task force. They're doing a wonderful job. As you can see, we're at 54 year to date. Um, and last year we were at uh, 120, 188. They're working hard to, uh, to uh, reduce the incidence of uh, stolen auto. Um, and it's a, it's a task force. Uh, what a collaboration of multiple towns, and the towns are 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 actually willing and 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 excited to assist Hartford in this effort, and they are doing uh, most of the work, of course, in Hartford. So some uh, good highlights here are that we are graduating twelve Hartford police recruits on May thirteenth. So all is uh, uh, welcome and the council will get an invite uh, for these 12 recruits. And on the fifth, we are actually graduating one recruit from the New Britain Academy. In the pipeline, we have, uh, we're processing about 95 uh, people now. And just behind them, we have about 120 that's about to be processed. Uh, so with those numbers, I don't know what we'll end up with, but uh, the chief uh, wanted to put the classes together and we might get a, a, a substantial class um, come uh, August or September. So look forward to that. 
Yeah. Oh, um, yep. Russell, what's the maximum per class? It's, uh, I believe it's 32. Uh, we have enough seats for 32. So I think we are going to get that um, this time around, which would be awesome. Um, we are continuing our efforts. We are working really hard at, uh, at um, getting a diverse group of individuals into this academy. Um, um, by all means, whatever, whatever you can think of, that's what we're likely doing. We're, we're, we're reaching out to people, we're having sessions, we're having literacy uh, sessions, we're having women, Women's Day, uh, trying to recruit more women. Uh, we're out there. I personally went to one of the written uh, practice examination, which is awesome that we give that, that before they take the actual exam. Uh, we have a practice exam. I went there, it was a great turnout. I talked to several, several of the uh, prospective uh, recruits and they were excited about the uh, prospects of being a Hartford police um, officer. And I also visited uh, when they came to the department for their first background uh, um, interview. And I, I have to admit, they looked sharp. I mean, they really did. Um, so a very diverse group, and they looked very sharp. Um, so I, I got to see two groups of people, and um, I look forward to seeing them wearing uniforms. So, of course, we have, um, you know, with the summer weather um, comes uh, somewhat of an increase um, in the uh, in um, crime. Uh, there's no different from here to New Haven, to Bridgeport, other, other places. Uh, so here though, in Hartford, we are responding. This is our summer um, response to this uh, increased violence. Uh, um, as you can see, we, uh, we um, have a collaboration of, of, of um, different means of reducing crime. We have the first one is, it. I'm sorry? It's too small for me. Oh, else. I'm sorry, I have my glasses on, so I'm cheating here. Okay, is that? That's, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so the first one here is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, target patrols. So this is kind of the traditional uh, officers in uniform. Um, uh, cops on the dots, uh, hot streets and the hot locations that patrol officers will focus their attention on. Uh, this has been proven. This is evidence-based. Nothing here we do is not evidence-based. Well, I can't say that. We do some other things, and that's within the, the realm of community policing that you want to experiment to see if it works. And, um, and we want to be innovators of new ideas but primarily we work towards uh, evidence base to reduce uh, the violence. Uh, we got the street crime unit that will be out there. Um, um, we also have directed uh, traffic patrols. So those motorcycle units, the uh, traffic uh, checkpoints, DUI checkpoints, they'll all be out there. And these, uh, the traffic unit will be focused again on hotspots and, and uh, hot streets and uh, locations where we have uh, seen high levels of violence or uh, um, we there's also predictive analysis that we can look at that is likely to have violence because we looked at the comps that packet from uh, last year. We can determine where these hotspots are likely to be and we can deploy officers in that direction. We have the narcotic unit that will be out there. We have the crisis incident response uh, team that will be out there. And that I believe is also uh, our chief's <clears throat> creation, which is the non-shoot, uh, non-fatal shoot team who investigate shooting. So uh, I believe this came out of Denver, Colorado, um, where uh, it was experimental and then it was a success that uh, we, uh, you know, uh, Policing sometimes look at the just the fatal shootings, but we want to look at the people who are non-fatally shot and explore those things um, and investigate the, those those uh, uh, incidents so we can prevent a you know fatal shooting. So I believe this has been a success. Uh, that team goes out, they analyze the data, they uh, collaborate with the uh, other teams to um, do their best to reduce 
shootings in the city. Uh, we have community engagement. Of course, we will never um, stop with our community engagement. Uh, that is part of the community policing efforts and that we are committed to, and we will always uh, be part of that and um, welcome our community to talk to us, to sit with us, and to come up with ideas on how to better police uh, their neighborhoods. So we are always um, out there. Uh, Greater Hartford Regional Auto Task Force, uh, I spoke about that. Uh, it's a success. Um, Chief Doty has mentioned how the other towns are just excited to work with Hartford police officers. And that says a lot, you know, um, uh, that they're just excited to be with us, to not only work with us, help us reduce crime, but to learn from us so they can take it back to their communities, which is a great thing. And we utilize them uh, because uh, the more the merrier. So then we have targeted warrant roundups. Uh, we actively um, gather up warrants to try to reduce our uh, the amount of felony warrants and misdemeanor warrants that we have. We have successfully been doing this for some time now. We work with the courts. We work with our detention uh, division to assure that we don't have an overload. Uh, we send out letters um, also to people. And believe it or not, I, I, you know, um, when we send out letters, they actually People actually want to get rid of their warrant. They'll come down, we'll send out a batch, and it, this has been very successful. They've been coming down. Hey, listen, I didn't know I had an arrest warrant. And um, we call, contact the court, we coordinate, and it's been working very successful. So we will continue that. And with all of this, we have uh, special events, of course, uh, and we predict a lot of special events because of COVID, right? The COVID has subsided. So we are excuse me, I'm going to have a lot of things uh, this year and we're excited about many of the things. We're happy that uh, people are back out um, and enjoying um, the city of Hartford. So we look forward to those. Uh, we are going to do as we normally do. We are going to do be our best at protecting the citizens and guests that come to our city. Uh, and lastly, okay, I'm sorry about this, uh, Project Longevity. We're going to have a Project Longevity call-in um, in May. Um, now, uh, what's not on here is Project Safe Neighborhoods. We just had one. Uh, Chief Doty has spoke with a bunch of, uh, of people, um, you know, um, that have on probation, parole, and so forth about the importance of uh, stopping the violence. Um, so um, we've done, we did that last month and now we are going to have Project Longevity call in next, uh, next month. So um, with that, uh, this, just the city events, we have yard goats, which is uh, six days in a row. Uh, uh, they're playing home all evenings, um, except for Sunday at 1 p.m. And we have soccer at the Dillon Stadium, and uh, that will be tomorrow at 7 p.m. And we also have uh, public comps that this week, Thursday, uh, April 21st at 5.30. Um, so if you want to uh, join us, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, just go to the city, Harf city of Hartford uh, website. And that is our presentation. If you have any questions. Yes, uh, on the public comps, that is that in person or virtual? That is virtual. Virtual also, okay. And uh, when, um, when would it become in person? Uh, we're, we're, so we're exploring that now to see when uh, is the best time, because as I understand it, and you probably all have heard, like there's some uh, indication that there is a tiny, you know, there's a spring break. So there's a, a spike, a, a semi spike. So we're, we're monitoring that and we are we are we're looking forward to having having it in person. So if uh, COVID cooperates with us. Um, we, you should hear very shortly that we will be announcing public comms that in person. Okay, thank you. If you can pull your screen down, please. So, so if I exile, 
I'm afraid I'm going to X you all out. <laughs> I see uh, Councilman laughing at me. Okay. So does that work? No? So far. How about now? Uh, you got to X out your, your whole screen. Okay. Oh, good. Very good. No, you still have your... You, you see everything? Yes. The icons. Your main screen is up. So, and you have to stop sharing your screen. Okay, okay. There we go. All right. Um, so, be, before I ask my colleagues for any questions, um, well, let, let's do this. So, if any of my colleagues have any questions, please just have one question so that we can move on the uh, rest of the items, and then we'll come back to the uh, to any other questions that we have for HPD. So, Councilman Nick LeBron. All right, uh, and to you, Mr. Chair, I just want to make sure I understood. You you want us to only ask one question because there's other P, there's other PD presentations, Correct. and they come yeah. back whatever questions we had yes. at that time at the end. Correct. Okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, AC, uh, how I was laughing with you, never at you. So that's the first thing. And to you, Mr. Chair, I just want to just uh, piggyback um, the fact that Hartford Athletics playing the New York Red Bulls is kind of a big deal. It's the third round of the Lamar Hunt Trophy. Um, so, so we're playing like an A division team and we're a B division team. So it's kind of a big deal. I recommend everybody go out there. It's going to be a great, great time and great crowd. I'm glad that you shared that with us. Um, so my one question um, is for traffic enforcement, in particular, are any of the traffic enforcement efforts done during non-traditional hours? Yeah, so uh, we we absolutely do uh, traffic enforcement uh, non-traditional hours, uh, various times. We don't we don't want to be predictable, but what we do do is we follow the data of where most of the violations may occur. We you know when citizens uh, give us calls on. On, uh, or someone like the council or some uh, the mayor's office gives us locations, then we'll deploy people in those uh, locations so that we can uh, address those issues. But to answer your question, absolutely, we, we do it at non-traditional time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, anyone else has a question? No? Okay, so we're gonna move on to um, item 2.2 um, for the mayor a uh, resolution authorizing Hartford Police Department to accept a vehicle donated by the National Insurance Crime Bureau, NICB, for use by the Hartford Police Auto Theft Unit. Who would like to speak on that? We have uh, Lieutenant Pia that um, oversees that uh, auto theft initiative, so he's going to talk about that, uh, that resolution. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, so uh, as the chief said, Lieutenant Anthony Pia, I oversee um, a couple different things here, but one of them is the, uh, the auto theft unit. Um, the NICB, which is the National Insurance Crime Bureau, works with uh, the insurance companies to uh, obtain vehicles once they've been, most of the time they're um, stolen vehicles that have been recovered, uh, and then the insurance company pays out the individual who had their vehicle stolen, uh, and that vehicle becomes uh, part of the NICB. Those uh, vehicles will commonly uh, be donated to uh, police departments for use in auto theft enforcement uh, and investigations. Um, the NICB uh, typically uh, will give this vehicle to the to the town to the cities to the police departments for a one dollar. Um, they have some rules with the vehicle, basically that uh, the vehicle is to be used for auto theft. Um, investigations and crimes of the advantage that that would give our division is that our auto theft, uh, unfortunately, our auto theft crimes have crossed um, into the violent crime area uh, quite quite often, which we, we all know about. So uh, that would help us uh, both on the auto theft, uh, but also in the violent crime area. Uh, these vehicles are typically uh, civilian passenger vehicles um, that uh, you know, that gives us an advantage that they can blend in uh, in the neighborhoods and obviously uh, afford us a little bit of, of uh, uh, undercover 
access to those vehicles. I'm, I'm searching for the right word here, but I apologize. Uh, so those those vehicles uh, will be instrumental in the apprehension of auto thieves as well as violent criminals. Um, the um, NICB regularly gets these vehicles for us. Unfortunately, we've lost uh, access to some of these vehicles in the past just because of the timeline involved in, uh, in getting these vehicles uh, to, the, to the city. Um, so we are looking to get uh, some of these cars from them and, and some kind of uh, um, open agreement where we can access these vehicles when they come available so that we don't have uh, some of the delays that have caused us to lose those vehicles uh, like we have in the past. Currently, right now, there is a Jeep um, that is uh, available that can be given to the police department uh, at, uh, at the $1 thing. And the, um, the only other requirement that they have is that when the vehicle meets its end of its life here and it's in its function, that we uh, crush the vehicle, which we've done in the past, so that uh, that vehicle can't be used for any kind of monetary gain the agencies that it's provided to. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant. And before I go on, I just want to say thank you uh, for your presentation, uh, AC Howell. It was great, very informative. Um, I, I, I think it's more of a, uh, the report was um, not so technical for our audience. And I think that's very important for our audience. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, any questions from my colleague on this? Anyone? No. So can I entertain a motion? I uh, motion to approve this motion. That's it. Thank you. Sorry. Second that motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Pass. Pass to council. Now we're moving on to item 2.3 uh, from the mayor, a resolution authorizing the city to accept a grant of 125,000 from the state of Connecticut OPM criminal justice policy planning division for the Hartford Violence Intervention Support Initiative. Who will speak on this item? Uh, hi, it's Kim Oliver. I'll speak on this item. Okay, director. Hello, um, and I would like to share my screen. Uh, Yes, I'll pin you right now. Okay, you are pinned. Okay. All right. So can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. Wonderful, okay. Um, and I know um, we've already had a long meeting, so I'm gonna speed this up a bit. Um, just to give a little bit of background uh, to our department, Families, Children, Youth and Recreation, and why we're here tonight, um, uh, we, we have our values that go through all of our work. Uh, these are our four tenants, ready for school, college, and career, have a healthy start, feel safe, included, accepted, and supported, as well as have access to economic um, opportunities and support. Um, the reason I bring this up is because the way we do our work is really about getting and keeping our young people on safe and productive paths through the lanes of work that all of you are familiar with, with us with early childhood education, youth development, workforce development, and recreation. But what I wanted to point out on this slide here is, as you can see, in our department under youth services, we do engagement employment, but we also do youth justice. And so tonight, um, I'm going to talk about uh, this um, resolution and as well as um, a second one that falls under that um, uh, youth justice work. So just as a reminder, I know many of you already know this, but I'll go through a bit quickly. Um, uh, our opportunity youth in our city right now, we do believe the number is at 8,000, unfortunately, which is an increase. Um, our, our opportunity youth is defined as 16 to 24 year olds who are out of school and uh, not working. So our number, uh, unfortunately, has basically doubled. We actually brought our number down with a lot of system change work collectively between the years of 2013 to 2019, about 1,000 young people. Um, but again, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, um, our young people, especially our young adults, were impacted severely. These young people, again, uh, you're probably all aware, they're facing a lot of different challenges. They're listed here for you. And by the way, I'll make sure that this copy of this presentation is, is given to all of you. 
As part of our opportunity population, we have a significant um, segment of them that are justice involved youth. We define justice involved youth as young people who also may be at risk, because of course, as you know, a federal definition means they're arrested. Um, but our young people are exactly what you uh, would expect. Uh, many of them have had multiple contacts with law enforcement and our uh, justice system. But many of them have also been in a lot of different programs. Uh, there is some belief that sometimes, hey, we just connect these young people to programs. We have seen that many of our young people that we're working with are connected to one, two, three, four, five programs, and they're just not always coordinated. These young people um, many times enter in, and begin to do that cycle of becoming a victim and then an alleged perpetrator and just continuing that on. And in particular, I want to lift up uh, this data point that from July to October uh, 2020, uh, we actually saw that there were 28 uh, shootings and stabbings in our city with uh, youth by, um, victims under the age of 25. So we did see, especially with uh, the pandemic, some increased numbers in that area. So as a result, one of the works that we do in our department is that we aim to make sure that we have an ability to respond immediately and make sure that is coordinated. We know if we don't have those two pieces that um, our responses just won't be as effective um, as possible. So we've had a group meeting, and I'm gonna to go to my next slide, our youth violence prevention and intervention work group that has been meeting monthly and um, over the last few years, starting around 2018 or so, but really picked up in uh, 2019, where we have basically three big buckets of areas. Um, one is just in terms of clarifying roles. Uh, we already know uh, in Hartford, a lot of our partners with best of intentions sometimes overstretch. Doesn't mean you're always the best person to do a certain thing, but also we know that there's gaps at times, for example, housing for our young people. So who is that that we can lean on uh, to assist with that? The other thing is we also uh, wanted to make sure we had some shared understandings and cross agency protocols, just meaning that across different organizations that we were agreeing to the same processes on how we were gonna handle things because we were doing things very differently. And then the last thing is that we did have a coordinated system where we had a pathway for our young people, especially so that they could get the services and supports that they actually need for their specific issues. As part of that, as I mentioned, um, we developed this work group. This work group is about 30 different organizations. It includes some of our partners here tonight. So thank you, especially HPD. I'm seeing, uh, or, or Sergeant Mastriani, and as well as Lieutenant Zarger. Uh, and um, they're very much working with us in this work. So we collaborate and coordinate with these organizations. And our goal is really to um, reduce youth violence. And again, we meet monthly. And we've learned a lot of things through this process. Um, one of the things is that this population is usually in a state of uh, transition and instability. And also the real importance that the work that we do, that it is individualized, culturally appropriate and trauma sensitive. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about um, tonight is so what's different about uh, these two grants that we're receiving and what we're trying to, uh, to achieve with them. And one of them is how do we also expand um, services to some of our young people that unfortunately are um, getting into our highest need bucket. Um, we define that as young people who are actively involved in um, violent activity, we believe, and, um, and basically are in imminent danger. Um, and uh, that network of young people, unfortunately, exponentially grows with, with their network. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the other piece of it is, is how is it that um, we're making sure that we have a dedicated staff and resources that can work with these young people on a long-term basis to coordinate all these different partners. Because again, we've had people doing this work for years with the best of intentions, with some really good work that's happened, but is not always been sustained, especially um, as young people move um, throughout and, and across all these different programs and services in our city. So uh, the first uh, resolution I'm talking about, the 125, and then I will pause, uh, <laughs> Chairman, so that then we could ask questions if anyone has it. So this uh, resolution is part of the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funds, and the goal was really to support anti-violence efforts uh, for our young people. 
And uh, again, I'm not going to read this entire slide, but I think what's really important here is that we know that the crisis was getting worse because of the pandemic. And what the state asks is, okay, we can provide $125,000. Would you be willing to uh, partner with the CBO? And, and we said yes. So uh, the details here is that uh, we partnered with uh, Compass Peace Builders. And one thing I want to be upfront about is that uh, this work was for calendar year 2021 for this work. Um, and Peace Builders went ahead and did the work. And so the request for the resolution tonight is for us to accept the funds so that we can actually pay Peace Builders for the work that they did. So in this case, um, as you know, um, Compass has the Peace Builders, which obviously is a very difficult position, but is a really critical position for engaging our young people. And as we were seeing these almost rings of young people, right, from our highest need to their friends and then their friends' friends, right, um, that we needed to have more staffing. And so we actually went to Compass Peace Builders and said, would you accept this $125,000 to pay for two additional staff to serve at least 30 uh, more young people? And they agreed to do that. And that process is very intense and detailed. And they actually do a lot of work uh, to uh, provide for job shadowing, et cetera, because being a peace builder, of course, is not for everybody. And so here, what I've listed here is just some of the things that um, they agreed to be able to do, which is some of that case management, uh, meditation, especially among peers and also the community patrols that have become so important, especially when we do have special events or we know certain activity that is happening and we do that in partnership with HPD. Um, we also wanted to make sure they were connecting to um, positive um, social networks and youth development activities. And finally, also being referred to um, other providers and services as needed. Our uh, short-term um, uh, goals were to identify and recruit up to 30 young people, make sure we were doing those prevention and intervention activities with them, linking them to those supports, and also um, really, uh, well, I have this unfortunately in the wrong place, but influencing the way that um, our young people and community uh, really view and respond to, um, to violence. That one's a long-term one. Sorry for that mistake here on the slide. So if we go to a long-term, we see that we wanted to really reduce the incidence of um, of violence and also ensure um, positive youth development. The budget for this again was $125,000. Uh, the grant supported 100% of the project. Um, the actual application was written in partnership with Compass. And as you can see here, the budget, all of it was for that contract um, with Compass. And at this point, I think I can pause and I can um, Stop sharing for a moment if I can figure out where my, my things went to. And then uh, we, I can offer anybody any questions if they have it. Okay. Yeah, so, so the reason why I skipped to this item is because I feel that this also sh should include HPD. Um, so how will this, or how, how will um, the police department get involved with this program? Um, as far as, you know, when they get the calls, again, as I mentioned earlier, let's say a domestic violence or mental health issues, how does this work in conjunction with, with HPD? Um, so we work with HPD on a regular basis from an operational standpoint. We work very closely with Sergeant Mastriani and his team. Um, we meet um, specifically, well, a couple of times, uh, we work with Mastriani a lot. But uh, we have monthly meetings so that youth violence prevention and intervention work group. Um, Sergeant Mastrani is on that uh, work group, as well as we meet with him every other week to actually go through lists of young people that we're concerned about. So when we talk about being able to identify high risk young people, we're doing that in partnership um, with HPD. So for us, even though this is a program, we do that one going and really do that across all of our work. Um, the work that we do uh, with, uh, with Lieutenant Zarger is actually looking at our trends data and as part of our um, race and, and uh, um, ethnic disparities work, it's, you know, the disproportionate minority contact um, work that we do uh, for the city. Okay, so that's, uh, so you basically spoke on item 2.3 and 2.4, and I'm assuming 2.9 is also under the same umbrella here, right? I, yeah, so I've only shared the slides so far for 2.3. And I think, yeah, I think there was some duplication um, 
with 2.8 and 2.9 in the agenda? Yes, you are correct. Or two, right, uh, 2.8 and 2.3 are the, the repeats. The, yeah. The, okay, so um, Chief Thody, uh, you have any comments on this? No, I think it's great. Um, you know, we talk, we talk a lot about, you know, folks outside of police having resources and having a stake in, in following up with, you know, with, with this kind of activity. And this is a good example of um, Kim and her team and the mayor's office going out and finding this funding to help with this stuff. I mean, this is, this is going to, uh, this is going to provide a multifaceted approach that we've been looking at trying to do for years. So I think it's great. Kim works uh, closely with, with Chris and his team. Um, Chris does a great job and he's on the call here as well. If he has anything to add, Chris, you can just go ahead and jump in. But, um, you know, I think this is much like the heart team and, and many other things that have been moving forward in the last year or so. This is another great example of collaboration. Thank you. Chief. You have the floor, Director Oliver. OK, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and share again. Sorry, I just wanted to. And you're going to be speaking on 2.9, right? Um. I'm, I'm getting them mixed up, but the one for almost $1.4 million. Right, um, right, correct. Okay, so this is um, the federal dollars that we re uh, are receiving from Department of Justice, the burn um, discretionary grants. Um, so uh, these grants, uh, it was set up to basically do what it sounds like, to help um, folks at a local level regarding uh, justice. In particular, they wanted to um, really allow us to, to say, okay, what is going on with us locally, a need that we really needed to address. And they were providing for training, technical assistance, et cetera. Um, the other thing that's really important is this was in partnership with a member of Congress. In this case, it's uh, Senator Murphy. So it was Senator Murphy who advocated for um, Hartford to receive these dollars and we received those dollars through his work. So um, program details here is that uh, we wanted to really make sure, again, this is for our young people who are at our highest need level. So now we're talking about 20 or so, maybe a little less of young people who are extremely um, in imminent danger. And we wanted to be able to um, really pull together all these other key elements that we thought was really important to the work and do it in a little bit of a longer term and sustained way. So what you're seeing on this slide is us really talking about how do we have a positive and mutually reinforcing youth development pathway that's a little bit more holistic than sometimes we talk about. So yeah, we have education, we have employment, but we also talking about health service and mentorship. And if you go to the uh, second uh, or the, um, the second half of the slide, you see this area where it's like testing and innovating um, new and um, our new innovative strategies. But really, it's about making sure that they're braided all together and a co in a cohesive and coordinated way for our young person, right? So it's very individualized. It is how is it that we can have multiple organizations working together in a way that's most appropriate for that young person and impactful. Um, you're seeing a lot of uh, words here in terms of evidence-based, healing-centered, all the stuff that we truly believe in that have been in these different um, disconnected uh, and, and very um, insular and isolated projects at time for our young people and really trying to bring all of this together under one umbrella. So this is a pretty intense undertaking but something that we believe is important for our young people. So our project goals and results is, is really to work with these 20 high risk um, um, JJ youth. So again, um, the other one for 125,000 was really about broadening right, so we could serve more young people. This one is so we can serve these young people um, specific number more intensely and more deeply. These young people, for the most part, are also our repeat offenders here in the city. So these are repeat offenders 
high risk, uh, imminent da danger. So as you can see here, um, we hope that 80% um, of them will complete the entire process with us in terms of intake and onboarding. And then you're beginning to see the results that we begin to see some decrease in, in high risk behaviors. We know that it, that may not be completely across all boards. We know that this takes time. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but uh, just that we are beginning to see those behaviors change. 60% um, reconnecting to education, post-secondary occupational training. A lot of these young people are not going to school, have dropped out of, of school or um, kind of, uh, uh, if they go to school, go to school very casually. Um, and, and there are some who, who go and we've had some young people in this group be successful in, in going especially to programs like New Visions where they feel it's a little bit more individualized and they can be by themselves on their own terms. Um, but for the most part, these are young people who are not going to school and, and they're truant. Um, and then finally, we're hoping that we can get a recidivism rate of about 50% or so over the entire time um, of the project or, or um, over some time, and you'll see that in a moment. So the budget for this project, uh, when I you know, did the numbers initially, it comes out to be about $1.8 million over three years. And what was important to the feds is for us to really think about sustainability. So as you see in the second bullet, my goal was to make sure that we could get the project up and running 100% under the grant for year one. And for us, um, year one would start July 1 of this year. We're right now, um, if accepted, we'll continue our planning process so that we could get it going for uh, July 1. But then as we go to, to uh, year two, we would begin to see, okay, there's some other dollars. They do not have to be general fund dollars, just meaning that they are not from this particular pot of money from um, this federal source. And then by that year three, we're down to 50% of the project cost. So again, you're beginning to see a sl uh, sliding scale there. The other piece of this is important is that uh, similar to others, we partner with our uh, community-based organizations and we're asking for some really specific services. So crisis intervention, detention and reach work, service learning, the clinical services, which we believe are crucial uh, to this population, and then also the data infrastructure so we can make sure that things are coordinated, but also that we're measuring some key elements and making sure we're seeing progress and addressing issues if we're not. And then finally, evaluation of the entire program um, to do our due diligence here. So um, I think that is it for uh, this piece. And again, I will stop sharing so people can ask questions. Any question from my colleagues, uh, Councilman LeBron? Yes, Director Oliver, and you may have uh, mentioned it and thank you for your efforts in getting this and uh, working with these, uh, I guess, high risk uh, young folks. Um, <clears throat> the question was on that budget line, there was an indirect line. Um, and normally with indirect lines, they're, they're norm I've seen them associated with like paper clips, paper and stuff like that. What, but then I've seen a supply line. Can you ex elaborate on what that in indirect line is? Yes, uh, so, so our indirect lines, most of the time here at the city, we don't uh, um, ask for any indirect. So indirect allows us to have a set of dollars that uh, we can set aside that are not allocated at this time, right? So if we run into any certain issues, like for example, if staffing ends up being a little bit more expensive than we thought it was gonna be, or we found ourselves in a situation where we wanted to have stipends for our young people who were in the program above and beyond what we expected or other support services, we would be able to reallocate that out. Um, it allows to give us some, some wiggle room basically. Um, so I did build it into the budget. Most times we don't do that just because we usually don't have that kind of funding, but they gave us the opportunity to, so we, I did add it. And uh, one more question to you, Mr. Chair. So if it's, if it's intended, and, and I understand the fluidity of it, particularly with a project and, and a population that's so you know, vulnerable and has a lot of moving parts, I saw uh, at the front part, uh, most of it was uh, associated in year one, and then it exponentially decreased, I believe, tenfold for the next two years. Why was that? Okay, so it the actual um, cost of the program. So what we're what what um, 
The plan is that most of the work is happening between years one and two with the young people. So the larger project is over three years. But what we're trying to do starting July 1 is engage the young people for a minimum of 18 months to then um, hopefully two years and then have another six months with them of trying to do kind of supportive retention work. Um, so you're getting to see a little bit a slight of a decrease that way. The other way you saw the decrease was in terms of the um, the uh, funding from the feds themselves. So uh, that 100% to then 75% of cost for year two and then 50% of cost for year three. And that was sustainability. And so part of my job now is to secure additional funding to, to close that gap. I hope I answered your question. I, I was talking more specifically with the indirect line, not the overall. Oh, okay. because, because yeah. I guess my yeah. thought my thought would have been, and again, maybe I'm, my thinking is wrong and through you, Mr. Chair, um, the like if, if there's ability to be fluid over a three year span, why not distribute that money equally over a three year span? Or did we anticipate more fluidity or more upfront costs that would have to be manipulated in year one? Because I know with the feds, they're really strict on their dates and not allowing rollover. Um, so just, just wanted to know what the, you know, the mindset was. Um, yeah, so what it is is actually through a formula, and I'm just trying to double check that I didn't have an error on that because I see that it says like it's 57 and then it drops tremendously to uh, 6,100 to 6,400. Right. Right. Um, sometimes that's the spread of the money in terms of the way um, for, for other purposes. So in other words, that uh, sometimes we have to front load it. But I am going to double check that line. And if you don't mind, Councilman, I'll follow up with the group. Just make no sure. problem. No problem. I, I, I just thought of it in terms of strat strategy. And it's one of the things that with grant lines. So I would just wanted to, you know, maybe there was an anticipatory, you know, uh, you know, I understand the need to be fluid. I was just curious. That's all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Director. Any any question from my colleagues? No, you have the floor, Director. Okay, well, so are you done with the presentation? I'm done with the presentation. Thank you for um, <laughs> okay, uh, thank bearing you. with me with my two-parter. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing this uh, happen. And I do have a question when it comes to uh, partnering with the uh, Hartford Police Department and the Fire Department. Um, what is in place so that these two departments um, can get involved with mentoring or supporting um, your department to make this uh, successful? Um, yeah, and I would definitely open this up, up to my colleagues. I think, you know, it's, it's for me, it's a, a great opportunity for my department to be working with both um, police and fire because um, sometimes the perspectives are coming off and from different places. One of the things that have been really clear to me is the work that our colleagues are doing, especially on the law enforcement side that um, sometimes um, you, you don't realize and also seem to be really um, discouraging um, when we're not seeing the change that we're hoping with our young people. But what I can say, it becomes critically important in our work around community diversion, work that, as you know, in our state, uh, we really highly promote. Um, we don't want to incarcerate our, our children, um, but we do need to have very formal and structured, supported ways to be able to take care of them in community. And we have to do that in partnership um, with public safety. There's no other way about it, because unfortunately, we're dealing with um, life or death in most of these cases. But I open it up to any of my colleagues if they want to share. Any, any comments or questions from my colleagues? Okay, so I, I, I do have a question for you, Chief Thody, on this uh, program. Um, how, how, do, how do you see, or what's your opinion as far as the 50% that does not make it uh, through this um, program um, that are rearrest? Uh, is that correct, uh, Director Oliver? Uh, there's 50% there that you showed? Yeah, we're hoping for a 50% um, recidivism rate that will only be 50. Chief? Yeah, I mean, you, you have to start somewhere. Um, you know, I think the 50% that Kim and her team are, are, are looking to achieve was, you know, those were realistic numbers that were put together, you know, in, in collaboration with Chris Mastriani and, and, and others. I, I think they need to have 
you know, realistic goals. So, um, you know, I'd love to have that number be, you know, zero, but um, I, I don't think right now that, that, you know, that that's an attainable number. So, um, you know, the, the police department tends to engage with the, the, the folks that are, um, you know, that are repeat offenders that are involved in that recidivism. And, you know, right now that rate is significantly, you know, higher than 50. So if they can bring it to 50, that's going to reduce, um, you know, the interactions that we have. And that's the goal. So I, I think, you know, if if the research is saying that 50 is the attainable goal and that's and that's where they want to strive for at first, then, you know, who knows, year four, year five, uh, you know, maybe that turns to 40 and 30 and um, and moves on. But, um, you know, the, the lower that number gets, the better off we all are. But I think, you know, to, to Kim's point, you know, you have to be realistic in your expectations. Thank you, Chief. So before we continue on with HPD, I'd like to get um, entertain a motion to accept item 2.3 to receive the $125,000 $125, from OPM Criminal Justice Policy Planning Division, and also 2.4 to receive the uh, $1,398,686 from the United States uh, Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs. So moved with a favorable recommendation back to council. I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, abstain. Okay, pass to council for favorable recommendation. Thank you, Director Oliver. Um, so now, you know, uh, I appreciate that presentation because I think it's, uh, it will work hand in hand with HPD, especially H HPD and, and, um, and of course the Hartford Fire Department. Um, so Chief, um, thank you, uh, Director Oliver. Um, so Chief, um, welcome. I know you've been busy uh, taking your courses and and, uh, and, um, and Assistant Chief Howell, thank you so much for um, taking charge. Um, before I start, I would like to say I want to commend the Street Crime Unit uh, Vice and Narcotics and the Major Crimes Unit. Um, I, I, I know they're doing a great job, especially with the uh, that major bust out on Franklin Avenue uh, where there was basically a supermarket of drugs um, and taking, taking the, the guns and uh, ammunitions off the streets. Um, with that said, um, we have a huge amount of residents that are very concerned um, because there is an uptick in shootings. Um, there is an uptick in homicides. Uh, I understand it may be lower than um, other years, two, three years ago, but we're talking about today's day and age, this year, and we're not even in summer yet. Um, so can you share with us, what is your take on what's going on? Is this gang related? Is this a turf war or is you know, in my opinion, I do feel that it's a ma still a major problem with the court system. So if you can elaborate. Yeah, I mean, the, the um, you, you know, the, the, the numbers and, and what we're seeing uh, is not indicative of that. You know, as you, as you look at the ComStat package and those those are the, the that reflects the, you know, the actual incidents and what the city's seeing, uh, you know, our shooting incidents right now, as you looked across one and two and three and four years ago, uh, they are down. Um, you know, they're trending in the right direction. And that's a direct result, as Chief Howell said, of, of programs like um, that we've implemented similar, you know, like the, the non-fatal shooting team, you know, that, that team success and the, you know, over 200% increase in, our, in, in arrests and in, in non-fatal shootings, that's going to have an impact. Um, you know, the courts, um, there's a lot that I would like to, to see uh, where, where certain individuals that, that we can show a nexus to violence or a history of violence or gun possession or or violent drug dealing. Um, there are those individuals that I would like to see held longer for sure. Um, I'd like to see uh, them monitored closer with parole and probation. The mayor and I have been talking about that for quite some time. Um, but, you know, when you make an arrest for an assault with a firearm or someone is actually hit, uh, we tend to get good, you know, those folks do tend to stay uh, in jail. Um, so, um, as we increase the solvability rate in our homicides, I mean, we're well over 70% for two years in a row. Uh, you're going to start to see those incidents. It's going to have an impact in those incidents. We are aggravated assaults are down. Our non-fatal shootings are down. The numbers are trending in the right direction. 
couldn't say the same thing, you know, two years ago uh, and, and a year and a half ago when all of these numbers across the country were really spiking. And as you look to other communities, they're not seeing the decreases that we're seeing. Um, so that what we're doing is working. You know, you mentioned a couple of places. Uh, Street Crimes Unit has been great. Um, they helped us uh, seize a lot of firearms last year, as you saw on the slide. Um, many, many more than the year before. And that was a year where people were saying that the police were stepping back and they weren't doing enough. Not our cops. I mean, our cops were stepping up and doing a lot of work. Look, we look at the gun numbers this year. We're already over 100, I think 111. Um, and we're only three months really into the, you know, going on four months into the year. If those numbers continue, we'll probably seize over 400 guns this year. That means there's too many guns out there, but it also means that our cops are pulling those illegal guns off the streets. If you look at the slide, um, and, you know, certainly we can send you that presentation if they haven't already. Um, I'll have AC Howell make sure that that presentation goes out. But if you look at the slide on narcotics, we've got uh, Lieutenant Pia here on the call. Um, the amount of search warrants uh, it, that they've done so far this year exceeded the total number of search warrants that they did in the entire year, two, year, two years ago. Um, that's year to date. We're in year, we're in month four. So when we look at the auto theft numbers and the auto theft arrest, when we look at the drugs um, that these that these officers are seizing, you look at the um, not the hot mamas uh, hit that you were talking about on Franklin Avenue. Uh, you look at the amount of guns that they're taking off the street. We're talking about um, narcotics, firearms, and stolen cars. We know all those three those three things have a nexus uh, to violence and the violent crime that we're not seeing. We're seeing not just here but across the state and across the country. Um, those numbers are indicative of the work that we're doing. That is not by accident. That is a planned, um, those, those are planned operations. That, that is a targeted approach um, that myself and the, and the command staff here and, and our lieutenants that are doing a great job out there in the, the neighborhoods and in the, in the different divisions, that's all on purpose. Uh, and that's what's going to drive these numbers down. We, get, we can do what we can do. Um, as far as the courts go, we work very closely with GA14. We work, we work closely with parole and probation. Would I like to see some of the, you know, the sentencing and some of the bond issues taken care of? Yes. Um, and we talk to the mayor about it and the mayor talks to the legislators about it. Um, you know, we're doing what we can, but we control what, what we can control. Um, you know, and this year, uh, you know, so far we're seeing some of those, some of those benefits. Uh, the homicide numbers are up, um, but um, with our um, violence analysis that we just had done, uh, we know that the majority of our homicides and gun violence are stem from drug transactions, personal disputes, and then the third category is gang or group activity. But those personal disputes are putting people in close proximity to one another with firearms, which is why most of our, of our, of our homicides that have happened this year are gun homicides, and they happen in close proximity. So where you know, we saw you know, some of these, these gang and turf shootings that happened at a distance or, or where people didn't get out of their cars and did drive-bys, they didn't tend to result in death. They didn't tend to result in these homicides. But sometime, but this year, we're seeing people being sh shot from very close. And that's because these are personal disputes. These are people that have very personal beefs. Um, and some of that is driven, uh, a lot of that is driven by the drug trade. So that's why you're seeing uh, our reaction to that. That's why you're seeing those search warrants. That's why you're seeing that amount uh, of fentanyl being seized. That's why you're seeing those, those drug arrests increase significantly because we know from our research that that is, that that is the root cause. Now we have a summer plan, um, you know, like we do every year. This year it's very comprehensive because it includes everything that we've seen in the last couple of years, pop-up party, street racers, ATVs, quads, uh, violence, uh, so far, so on and so forth. Um, you know, that, that what you saw on that slide was a summary of that summer plan. Um, you know, the summary can be, uh, you know, is, is something that we'll have up on the website. It's something that we'll, we'll release. The plan is much more comprehensive. Um, you know, it's, it's dozens of pages. It talks about time of day, day of week, um, patrol allocations, resource allocations. Those are, that's not going to be a public document. Uh, certainly something that we can speak to generally, um, but that is an operations plan um, that, that we have. Uh, you know, ready to go. Uh, and that'll go into effect May 1st. Um, and the past, it, it has gone into effect later. This year, we want to make sure we get ahead of the curve. But those, you know, those proactive activities that you're seeing on the news, I mean, um, you know, the Franklin Avenue arrests, some of these homicide arrests, you know, that's all of us being proactive. We don't have to wait until the summer gets 
uh, gets here and until people are wearing short sleeves to be engaged in, in that kind of activity. So, um, you know, that's the police department's um, commitment and, and we'll continue to do it. Councilman LeBron. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, uh, I missed the, uh, um, the piggybacking on the reduction of crime and, and, and all that. So I just wanted to share some good news. Uh, it looks like Jamira just got notification from grandma that uh, Jamira was found. Um, so thank you to everyone and uh, HPD particularly. It looks like she's safe and sound is the message that I got. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, so I have another question for you, Chief. Um, so going back to uh, the bonding, how, e how easy is it for someone to bond out? Uh, because I heard that there's several ways they can bond out. And most of the time is is very easy, especially for. I'm not sure if uh, um, wielding a gun is considered a violent crime arrest. Um, but can you can you share um, what you know about that? I mean, that's not our process. Uh, I don't want to speak out of school. Um, you know, the the problem is that it's become a lot easier to bond out now. You can actually finance the bond. Um, you know, there's ways to take, you know, so if you're a $100,000 uh, bond, if we put a $100,000 bond on somebody and, and they they have to put up 10% of that at, at $10,000, you know, they can now finance that $10,000. There was a time where there, there wasn't a way to do that. Um, you know, the we we put pe we put bonds on people based on our, um, you know, practices and, and our manual. We have a manual in detention um, that puts bonds on people based on their criminal histories and, and what the crime was. And then the, the, the bail bondsman comes in, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the bail commissioner comes in and, and they adjust that bond. A lot of times they lower that bond. Uh, that has been a problem for years. Um, we have now a relationship with uh, GA14 and, and we have two prosecutors that uh, state's attorney Charmise Walcott has, has dedicated to us where we can call them and notify them when that happens. And, and they go to a judge and they get the bond. Oftentimes they can get the bond put back up where we set it. Um, you know, the problem is that carrying an illegal firearm is not a violent crime uh, in, in the initial arrest, right? But, but a lot of times we try to show that, you know, this is the fourth or fifth or sixth gun this person has had. They've been a victim of, uh, uh, they've been shot in the past. Uh, they have a propensity to be the next shooter or the next homicide victim. We don't want them out on the street because we don't want them to get killed either. Um, so when we can show that stuff, uh, a lot of times we'll get a good result, but it depends on the judge. It depends on a lot of variables. Uh, whether they take that into consideration. A lot of a lot of times they only look at the four corners of the arrest warrant uh, or, or the arrest report. So they'll say, okay, you know, this person just was found with a with a gun, you know, in their waistband and they don't have a pistol permit. And that oftentimes people do not do any significant time for that. What we're trying to do, and Chris Mastriani, who's who's on here, does a great job of, of providing the court, court with a dossier that shows um a lot more of the picture. It may show, you know, it may show social media posts with with this individual pointing firearms or, or doing things like that. We try to show the whole picture to say, hey, look, we really need this person, you know, off the streets for a period of time, you know, in, until we can, um, you know, until we can make sure that they're not going to be the next shooter or the next victim. And that's a challenge. It's it's you know a challenge in a lot of places. We're seeing it all across the country. I think we're at we have a little advantage here because of our relationship with Charmise Walcott and the state's attorney's office, and they do swoop in and help us out quite a bit, um, you know, but it still is an issue. Okay. So has there been um, any incidents where there has been several arrests for an individual with gun, handling a gun uh, has done that, uh, shoot someone or you know, murder someone? Has there been any incident? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, we when you if you look at the violence analysis, I know not everybody had time to, to go to the town hall, but it's recorded. Um, you know, I would go back and take a look at that, and it and it'll show you that you know eighty to ninety percent of these folks had some predictive behavior uh, prior to being you know a shooter or a murderer. Um, you know, the criminal histories are very similar: narcotics, firearms, um, you know, firearms possession, stolen firearms. There, there, there's there are indicators out there, um, and it. And if you look at it, we've made several several arrests on a lot of these folks that end up being victims or perpetrators of violent crime. And do we have a list of perpetrators that um, we're keeping an eye out on? Yes. 
Okay. We, we uh, you know, the, our intelligence division, C4, Chris's folks, uh, we have an entire division that's dedicated also the major crimes division. Um, you know, there we have uh, shooting reviews every morning after after there's a, a shooting, after somebody shot. Uh, we get together at nine o'clock in the morning the next morning um, and we talk about, you know, who this person is, who what they were involved in. You know, what's the propen propensity for, uh, you know, retaliation shooting? Um, you know, who are the players? You know, should we go out and, and look to, to scoop a couple people up and let them know that we're, we're looking at them? We bring project longevity in, offer them alternatives. Um, those are processes that have, that have been in place here. They've they've been honed in the last year or two to be a little sharper, but those are processes that have been in place here for a long time. Okay, I, I, so I want to go back a couple of, a few years. Um, there was a unit. It was the uh, conditioning um, crime unit. I think it was called back then, um, where there were eight officers and they would. Um, basically go to a hotspot, identify the uh, perpetrators and start cracking down on drug sales or, you know, robbery or what have you. Is there any- that the you unit you just complimented, that's street crimes. Okay, street crimes. Okay, so we have that, okay. It used to be called conditions long, long ago. They, it's changed names a couple times. Every time there's, you know, a new chief or a new strategy, they tend to change the names. But right now it's called the conditions team. It's been called the community response team. Um, you know, the, it brands in different ways, but it's eight officers north and eight officers south, and they focus on, um, you know, the most significant issues that we're having. Generally speaking, they focus on guns and violent crime and, and the nexus between stolen cars, uh, drugs, and that violent crime. Uh, but we do, you know, we do use them on occasion if we're having a real, uh, you know, a spike in, in pop-up parties or street racers or anything like that. They're a very nimble group. Uh, they're a proactive group, and, and we get a lot of bang for our buck with them. Okay. Good to, know. Good to know. Any questions from my colleague, uh, Council President Rosado? I, I have a question, and, and Councilman Sanchez, if you could refresh my memory. Um, Chief Thode, um Councilman Sanchez um, mentioned to me uh, a while ago, um, and I did get uh, a lot of positive calls um, from members of the community and through Facebook, um, where you had some sort of task force um, through the city where you were doing traffic stops. Is, is this something that a HPD is going to continue to do or, or is doing? So, oh, you so are? We, have a traffic, we have a traffic division. Um, they do most of our traffic enforcement this time of year. There is grant season for them. So that includes your click it or ticket uh, safety belt grants, it includes your uh, DUI, OUI, your, your, your basically your drunk driving enforcement. Uh, it includes your distracted driving campaigns and speed campaigns. Those four things uh, we get grants through the Department of Transportation. We get a, a lot of, of grant funding from them because our traffic division is so active. Um, you've, you've heard me brag about them before. They've gotten, we have Mothers um, Against Drunk Driving's Officer of the Year is, is Lieutenant, now Captain O'Brien. Um, you know, the, the accolades that they get are tremendous. So those programs, those grant funded programs, you will see them out there. A lot of times those checkpoints are, are on our website, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, but that's all grant funded to do traffic enforcement, traffic safety enforcement, those times and places that the councilman, you know, uh, I think it was councilman LeBron that asked about times and places, those grants that's dictated to us based on data that the department of transportation has. So they kind of tell us where to do those, a, lo a lot of those grants and, and what time to do them. And they're usually, um, you know, depending on the, on the type of grant, it varies days of week, time of day. Um, and then we also, that traffic division also helps us. You know, if we do have a homicide or if we do have a shooting and we want to do proactive measures, we've gotten information from people that we've pulled over, um, you know, that frankly, they don't want a ticket. And and they'll say, well, listen, I, you know, I might have saw this. And if I tell you that, uh, can I not get a ticket? If you remember, that's how the, the murder of Brian Azelton was caught uh, on a routine traffic stop. So those are all strategies that we employ that that's in that summer plan as well. So I want to piggyback on, on that question. So how about vehicles with uh, broken headlights, taillights, uh, you know, which is a safety issue? Are you allowed to uh, stop them and ticket them? We're allowed to. There's a lot of research out there that talks about how that, you know, that creates, uh, you know, some profiling issues. If you're not if you're not concentrating on the core moving violations, we also are out there for safety for for for, you know, if you if you haven't, uh, you know, noticed we have. You know, uh, we have speeders in the city. We have a we have a problem with with people that speed, with people that go through traffic lights, that go through stop signs. Um, we do not focus on equipment violations. 
Um, we focus on the core moving violations, speeding, stop signs, stop lights, distracted driving, things that are causing pedestrians to get hit by cars. Um, you know, could a, a broken headlight or taillight, could that maybe um, contribute to a pedestrian getting hit by a car? Yes, but it certainly isn't high enough um, on the priority scale like speeding and some of these other violations that are getting people hurt. So as a department, our philosophy is that we focus on the core moving violations. We don't focus on equipment. Any questions, statement from my colleagues? Councilman LeBron. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, is now the time that I, I can ask my other question that I yes, had? Sir. Okay, all right. So just two quick questions. Uh, um, the first one is in regards to uh, AC Howell had uh, mentioned that um, there that something about hot spots, and so um, what is the if we could dig deeper uh, and, and and you can explain more, Chief, as to how we're doing that because are we like are folks just sitting in that hot spot? Are we pulling folks from you know maybe safer places or places on patrol, and then we double down on those sections? Could you explain that a little bit more? So we presented this probably about a two years ago, maybe just before COVID. This is evidence-based uh, policing, the, the, the evidence-based policing model that we transitioned to. We changed our car deployment plan um, to move some of our uh, patrol areas to smaller areas in places where we have had violent crime for decades. Um, we did, you know, extensive analysis and, you know, a lot of the places where violent crime occurs hasn't changed a whole lot in over 10 years. It's the same corners, it's the same streets that we hear on a regular basis. Um, you know, we, we don't want to remove patrols uh, from some of the other areas in the city because it's important that we have officers there. But as you said, um, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, doubling down in some of those locations has been successful. Um, you know, we're not looking to, you know, engage in, in profiling activity. Um, so what this evidence-based policing model does is it takes these hot zones, which if you look at the ComStat maps um, that are online and that we talk about here, we go through the, you know, the numbers of ComStat, but the actual maps have these big kind of glow-in-the-dark areas, and they're blobs. They're generally blobs. Um, and what we found is that you can put an officer in that blob, and that blob could be four or five or six blocks so just because the officer is where we asked them to go inside that 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 heat where the heat map shows there's activity, it doesn't mean they're on the right street or in front of the right address. What we did is we dove down deeper into the data to show, you know, maybe, uh, you know, instead of a blob that surrounds Nelson Street, you know, maybe we're looking at the, you know, the 100 to 120 block of, of Nelson Street, and we want the officer there. So we won't miss it by a block or two. We're gonna focus on what we call the hot street instead of the hot zone or the hot area. And it gives our officers a little bit more refinement. And all it is is visibility. What we want them to do is go into that area for 15 or 20 minutes, twice during their shift, get out of the car, walk around, engage with some folks and let people know that the cops are in the area. If they see a crime, they obviously need to address it, but there's no stats that we're looking for while they're there. We're not asking them to pull cars over or do things like that. We're looking for them to be there. We're looking for, for them to identify, um, you know, environmental things that we might be able to change in those areas, crime prevention through environmental design. Can we fix a light bulb? Can we plant, the, you know, a bush to, to make it harder for, you know, for somebody to access a, a, an area where they're doing, you know, criminal activity. So the, this whole plan is, is a bigger, um, you know, kind of more broad-based look at crime, at crime prevention uh, and it gives them very specific areas to focus on. So you, Mr. Chair, just one last question. It's and it, it should be a short one. So um, uh, and and uh, uh, piggybacking on uh, uh, Chief, your uh, your statement around visibility and and uh, you know, as I would say, making your presence felt. Um, often, very often, it continues to be a conversation um, in terms of constituents, particularly in the North End who have pointed out on numerous occasions that there aren't any police stations. So as of now, I know there isn't um, any police stations now in the North End, but I'm just curious, what do officers do when they have to write up paperwork? What do they do if they have to use the restroom? That's a natural reaction, it's human, um, you know, uh, bio breaks, you know, all of that stuff. So like what is being done right now in the North End for the officers, um, you know, uh, in the community? 
So that's a great question. And there's a couple answers. Number one, we are trying to get some substations in the north end. We're working in an area right now on Main Street, uh, you know, upper Main Street um, in the in the same building that the address escapes me. I think it's 22, 2240 Main. It's where uh, Mothers United Against Violence is. It's that same building. We're looking at, you know, getting a substation there. Substations are great. You know, it it get it does to, it, it decentralizes the officers, and that's great. But at the end of the day, councilman, when I got on the job, there weren't substations, and what we had to do when we had to go to the bathroom is create relationships with people that had the ability to let us go to the bathroom. Right? We had to. I had to know business owners, and 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 I had to know. You know, I had to, you go to the hospital, and and you you knew the code, and you knew the nurse that was the charge nurse that day. Um, you know, you you went, you knew even people, you knew, you know, you know, Hyacinth or, or somebody that in the community that you got to know. Um, and, and that gave you, uh, you know, time to take a break, time to go to the bathroom, uh, you know, oftentimes a place to do your report. A lot of times you'd go to the bathroom and then you do your report at that business and your car would be visible there. Um, those things have been lost over time. Uh, and and we're trying to encourage our officers to be resourceful and and get back out into the community to develop those relationships and 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 find ways uh, to 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 mitigate that. It is one of the things. It's the carrot and the stick. You know, it is one of those things um, that, that you know that they've got to figure out to do. Now, as far as the reports go, we've come a long way with the new CAD RMS system and, and computers in the cars. A lot of times, they're uh, you know they're doing their reports in the cars, which is good because we want them out into the community. We want their cruise lights on. We want them visible. Um, and and so they don't have to come back to a substation, right? The sub if they have to come back to a substation to do their reports, then everybody knows that when they have to do a report, that's where they're going to be. And then you're going to have all these cops in one spot. I want them out. I want them, you know, I want them far apart. We keep an eye on their, um, you know, on their on their locations for that reason. I want them spread out. I want people to see them, you know, on side streets. I want them to, people to see them on main streets. You know, you want that omnipresence. It's hard to do. Um, you know, hopefully we get that staffing back up in that 450 range, 460 range, um, and we can bring back those 24 walk beats that we had before the pandemic. Um, and I think that'll help a lot. But but that's kind of our general approach to that. Thank you, Chief. And uh, thank you for I mean, you know, it's it's uh, uh, logistical, right? Like, uh, you know, but it makes sense, right? Like just those natural relationships and how things were done. Seems like we're we're going back and forth with our trending. Um, so, but thank you for the the clarity on that. Thank uh, you. You all said, Councilman. Yes, I forgot to say through you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. I always mess up on that. There's no issue with that. Um, so, um, I do have another question, Chief. How about the um, the cruisers? How many cruisers do we have that's active, and how many that are down? Uh, that's a that's a fluctuating number. I do get a report by email, um, you know, uh, usually biweekly on that. The biggest problem that we're seeing right now is the same problem that you would see right now if you walked into a Chevy dealership and tried to order a, a brand new Chevy Tahoe. They would tell you we'll see in a year. It's not different for us. In fact, it's worse for us. Um, some of these car manufacturers like Dodge have canceled orders uh, for, you know, for, for law enforcement because they, they can sell those those PPV, those police rated vehicles, they can sell those on the private sector for more money and they need them uh, for supply and demand issues. The biggest reason that we're seeing cars down right now is that, you know, you get into a minor front end collision and you rip a front bumper off a car right now, we can't get front bumpers for these cars. The Department of Public Works just can't get their hands on them. Um, so you can't drive the car around with no bumper. Um, so a lot of times these cars are being deadlined, uh, you know, starters, um, you know, radiators, uh, you know, maintenance issues that these cars run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and, and these officers are tough on them because the, the job requires them to drive them uh, in, in harsh conditions sometimes and they break um, and there's no parts to replace them. Uh, I still have all of the, you know, the new vehicles that we ordered last year are still not here yet. Um, they're not even scheduled to be built until the end of May. And then they have to get all the lights and sirens and everything put into them um, you know, uh, it's it's funny, you know, we we ordered a, a few new motorcycles for the traffic division and they were on ground ready to go. I, I don't know why we can build a motorcycle in 10 minutes, um, but we can't build a car in two years. Um, so a lot of these are, you know, I, I hear the complaints from the officers. We've put out uh, we put out a new memo uh, trying to reduce the use of the cars. So we're limiting like private duty 
you know, wh where you see an officer on the side of the road at, at, at uh, you know, at, at a private duty road construction job. Uh, we're limiting the use of the cruisers for that because we need to maintain these cruisers the best we can, as long as we can, because we're having a hard time replacing them. Um, you know, it hasn't been a, for once, it's not a budget issue, right? I, I, I'm able to budget these cars, the, the mayor's office and, uh, you know, and hopefully in another month or so, city council will, will approve our budget and we'll, we have, there's cars in there, um, but we can't get them. Yes, that's a problem. That's a problem we haven't had before. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're doing our best to keep our cars afloat. It is an issue. DPWs, you know, I've been in constant, you know, contact with Mike Looney. Uh, they've been great, but if they can't get their hands on the parts to fix the cars, that's a problem. So have we looked into a pre-qualified vehicles that we could purchase for the time being? What do you mean by pre-qualified? Well, so uh, a vehicle that that's, um, they do the 29-point uh, check uh, to make sure the vehicle is... Are you talking is, about a used car? Yes, it's there. The I mean, only thing that's harder to get than a new car right now is a used car. A used car. There's none. All right. There's none. Okay, so I guess we're gonna have to look into that, see what we can do. Um, any... I mean, we're, we're 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 doing the best we can with what we have. The biggest thing right now is is taking care of the cars that we have. That that is what we can do. And uh, you know, we we've got a a memo out. I had um, AC Howell and DC Rendock work on that before I left, um, and uh, and it's gone out. And it it's it's basically just giving our putting some onus on our supervisors to make sure. Um, that we're being careful with these cars and we're keeping them on the road because that is really the answer right now until we can get some fresh orders in and some new cars in. Okay. And then uh, my last question, um, are, how are the officers right now? Are they, are they, you know, overworked like last summer or are they kind of, uh, you know, doing all right? I mean, I'm pretty sure there's PJs and, uh, and uh, overtime, but um have we been holding officers over and calling them back? Not as much. We changed the holdover policy. Um, we actually use a tiered system now. Um, you know, we worked with the union uh, to change the way we hold over and order in um, where, you know, it, it's a tiered system. If you volunteer for one shift, you become a one and we order in or hold over all the zeros before the ones. If you order, if you, if you volunteer for two shifts, you become a two. We order in or hold over all the zeros and the ones before we get to the twos. So we're incentivizing them to take shifts at times that are convenient for them instead of waiting and getting ordered in. Um, so that has significantly reduced the number, significantly reduced the number of order ins. Um, we do have we do have another 14 officers that are coming off of FTO. I think nine have already been released. Um, so those are out in patrol now on their own, not in FTO. Um, so they're helping with the relief factors. Uh, but the bottom line is we need to bolster the numbers and that's what's going to keep, uh, you know, we're just in the spring. This year already there's more special events than we've seen in quite some time. Um, and, and we need officers to man those special events. So, um, you know, we'll see how, how this summer goes. Um, the winter traditionally we don't have the same staffing concerns. Folks are are more available to work than they are when the kids are out, you know, off from school and, and the same things that impact uh, you know, any job impact us as well. So vacation season will probably start ramping up. You know, we hit a little spike in April because April vacations and spring vacations and stuff, but it, it really doesn't ramp itself up again until May, June, end of May, beginning of June, and then it'll stay busy through, through August, um, September. Um, so we'll see. Um, you know, th this this academy class is graduating in May. Uh, you know, we, we moved the academy to a 10-hour day instead of an eight-hour day. We moved our practical skills to weekends. So we took a six month academy and it's, you know, it's, it's just under, it's about four and a half months now. We shaved off quite a few weeks um, to get these officers, you know, not reducing the number of hours that they're being trained, but, re, but increasing the number of hours in the day that they're being trained so we can get them out on the street sooner. Those, the officers that are in the academy right now will hit the streets in late summer uh, on their own uh, uh, answering calls for service. And that's what we wanted to do. Okay, thank you. Um, any other statement or or questions from my colleagues? I just have a, a, a quick statement. You know, I just want to thank you, uh, thank HPD and the leadership and um, continue to do a great job and everyone stay safe. Um, it's been yes. a long night. It's 807. Yes, it's 807. Thank so you, Council just President. About, just about thank over. You. So, um, you know, Chief and uh, AC Howell and everyone uh, from HPD, I just want to 
you know, thank you all for your hard work. I know it's not easy, especially being a police officer in today's day and age. Day and age. Um, I will say that, um, you know, knowing the low numbers of officers that we have, you guys are doing a tremendous job. Um, it's challenging. Um, you know, a lot of people don't like officers, but then you still have a lot of folks that I speak to that, and they love the officers. You know, they just hope and wish that there, there was more and hopefully we'll get to that point. Um, so um, please send our regards to the police officers in the, uh, in the department. And uh, just know that this body right here, my, my committee uh, supports you 100%. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone. And I, and I just want to say that it's very nice to see Lieutenant Pia and uh, Sergeant Masterani. Um, and I don't know, um, Anthony Rakowski, it's so nice to put your names, um, you know, uh, your face to the name because I've heard great things about you. So thank great you cameo appearance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. And thank you for uh, your time and, uh, and attending this meeting. So I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye.